Yes. Um, okay, we organized this workshop uh, as a meeting, uh, basically on Teams, uh, in order to uh, allow the, a better interaction uh, with the, with the, the participants. So um, we kindly ask you to keep the microphone and the camera off uh, during the the workshop in general. Uh, just the speaker uh, we left them on, and as soon as Antonio, who is going to be the moderator of this webinar, um, will uh, will give you the opportunity to to make a question and uh, or to reply or to interact, then this is the moment. For the rest, you can always use the chat to share your uh, your thoughts or questions or uh, or um, you can also raise the hands to to if you need to speak. Um, the agenda is the final one that we published. Uh, so the program is kind of, uh, we have a lot of presentation and uh, we need to keep on time. Uh, so I will wait just a few minutes uh, more uh, and then I would suggest to start. We have already... 18, we are. Okay. Yes. Yeah, good morning. I'm ready when you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good. So uh, it's already two minutes since we have a very tight agenda. I think uh, it will be good uh, to start right now. Uh, are we okay, Flamina? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So let's do it uh, officially. Good morning and uh, welcome to the Blade Erosion uh, Workshop. Uh, my name is Antonio Garte. I'm uh, the Wind Power Director at Fener. Uh, today I'm here, um, well, as moderator of this uh, workshop. Um, I I do this, but really my colleague uh, Beatriz Mendez is uh, who she has been organizing this workshop. But due to um, uh, COVID uh, restrictions, uh, today we have uh, Beatriz at home, so she had uh, some difficulties. But uh, nevertheless, she's going to be with us uh, in the backstage, and I will be here um trying to uh, coordinate all the presentations well uh the thematic that we have today i think is uh, of interest of uh, many people for from the response that we had uh, from uh, all the all the community uh is the blade erosion and uh this the sub program that we are managing in the era joint program win is the sub program for that take us of the aerodynamics loads and control and uh, as we seen, and uh, most of you know already, uh, there's a close relation from the erosion of the blades and uh, all these uh, topics. Uh, so uh, today we, well, today we propose to have this uh, workshop uh, uh, approaching the the great, well, great, the important issue that uh, means the erosion of the blades uh, from these points of view, as you might know. Uh, this issue of the erosion uh, is going uh, to be even more relevant in the offshore uh, deployment of the wind farms uh, due to many factors, uh, especially the rain. But um, this is something uh, relevant not only on the past, but for the coming uh, years for wind development. So I'm not going to go uh, longer than that because we have a very tight agenda today. We have uh, many uh, presentations. Let me go uh, very quickly from uh, the agenda, or at least a very preliminary um, outlining of the agenda. We're going to have uh, three sessions. Uh, the first session will be uh, on loads, the second session uh, control, and the third session in aerodynamics. Uh, I know that most of you know already the format uh, for these um, workshops. However, let me uh, remind you that uh, we ask the presenters to maintain uh, their presentations about 15 minutes. And uh, the last five minutes, we will dedicate them for questions. Your questions uh, can be written in the chat and uh, Bea will help me to collect the questions. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we will uh, uh, try to, to make them and uh, uh, discuss with the presenter about uh, these questions. So. Um, I think uh, we're going to go ahead with the first, uh, uh, yes, sorry, we will have also a break in this very tight session after the 10.30 presentation, so it will be around uh, 10.45, the, the break. 
Uh, but I don't know if you want to add anything else. Or yes, can... I, I would like to say thank you to all the speakers and to all the participants because yes. uh, anytime I ask them for something, <laughs> they, they appear here and help us with organizing this time of, type of things. So thank you very much. And as Antonio said, I'm going to be today like in the second role, but helping him with the questions and, and so on. So thanks a lot. And let's start talking about Play the Ocean. Yeah. Thank you, Bea. Uh, very true. <laughs> Thank you, the speakers, too. Okay, so uh, let's start with the technical session one. Uh, this loads. Um, the first uh, speaker is uh, Jacob uh, Listedbeck. Uh, Jacob, Jacob is a senior development engineer in DTU. So, Jacob, are you with us? Mm, Jacob? Yes, sure. Oh. Morning. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> <I'm mute. laughs> so I will share my screen. Yeah, I leave you the floor and uh, just uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, can you see my screen here? Yes, we do. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so loads, we, uh, we are. Historically, we have considered loads on blades as, uh, say, aerodynamic loads and gravitational and acceleration loads, so uh, affecting the whole structure. So here we uh, look at loads in the case of uh, the impinging uh, rain, which could also be other hydrometeors, but now we focus on rain uh, specifically. And um, and we know that uh, there is a, <coughs> a variation of drop sizes out there. And we, uh, we decided to see how the drop size affects uh, the erosion propagation in, the, in a rain erosion tester and how to model the variation of rain in the atmosphere. So um, I will move to the first slide. So we used this. Uh, rain erosion tester uh, at R&D and this is more or less today the industrial standard at least several OEMs and test institutes <coughs> use this a particular machine which is um, convenient because it's uh, yeah it's easier to compare but this is also a little bit disturbing that you need to say use the same machine to compare results because it seems that there are still things we don't understand. So why do you get different results from one erosion tester to another? Um, and to the right, we just see the impacts between yeah, a single uh, a single uh, droplet falling in the rain field. Now, now it decides to stop. Um, and <clears throat> and the, the rotating uh, specimen. So when you look at the rain erosion tester, you have an array here of, uh, of uh, needles that uh, uh, release the droplets. And you have a rotor here with three arms where the uh, specimens are mounted on them. Um, so and then you can see here how the arms rotate. And then this is just one single droplet. But here you have a a lot of droplets falling simultaneously and the, the rotor will see a, a, a number of uh, impacts all the time continuously. So um, we decided to, uh, <coughs> to uh, uh, use different rain fields and the, one of the measures you have to vary the rain field is what is called the needle type. So the droplets are released by uh, the water is uh, squeezed through a, a needle, um, a hollow, a small hollow tube, and we these are the codes for D20, 27, 30, and 20, uh, 70. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, 27 and 30. These are different diameters uh, of the uh, holes inside these tubes, and these uh, will give different droplet sizes. And we can also vary the flow rate. So <clears throat> this is the flow rate liters per hour through all the nozzles altogether. And um, with this configuration of 320 and 120 liters per hour, 
we get an average of 3.5 millimeter droplets. And with the other configurations, we can get around 2.4, 1.9. And the last one is what we call a spray mode. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the water is pushed through the, uh, the needle at a higher uh, flow rate, which uh, kind of um, releases a, a spray with a large droplet size distribution. And over here we have distrometer measurements of the three of these configurations. So you can see the green bubbles here are from the 2.4 or 2.35 millimeter on average. And you can see, see the distribution of drop sizes is fairly small. Uh, uh, in this uh, from around 1.5 up to 2.5. Uh, we even have some here, but that's a few. So you can see the distribution out here to the right. So it's quite narrow distribution. And the distribution of fall velocities is also quite narrow. And then we, we have similar for the 1.9. And then you can see the spray mode gives a huge cloud with a large variation of drop sizes and fall velocities as well. So how do these uh, drops affect the specimens? So first we see here, <clears throat> this is a micrograph uh, tr a cross section of a specimen. So you have down here the, the glass fiber bundles. And then in this case, you have a, a quite thick layer of uh, putty uh, or, um, that's is used to, to make a smooth surface uh, of the plate before you paint with the coating and then you have the coating here and <clears throat> a damage on such a coat early damage might look something like this um, i forgot to put a scale on this but i think this is in the order of uh, one millimeter uh, in uh, in dimension and if we zoom in we can see that part of the surface of the coating has been removed and there are some cracks uh, in inside the coating as well so when we do the tests, these are taken for two different uh, drops, uh, drop configurations. So the 3.5 millimeter droplets after 30 minutes and 7.8, uh, 0 0.7 <laughs> uh, after 30 minutes as well. <clears throat> and you can see here that the smaller droplets create more damage, but it's also a higher flow rate. So even though it's smaller droplets, there's more water hitting the plate. Uh, this is then after 60 minutes, and we can see with the small droplets, we have a more, say, distributed damage, and with the larger droplets, um, once, uh, actually, we can see where the, the, where the damage has localized, the large droplets make a lot of damage, so remove all the coating and the putty but in the between where it has not really localized, it's the, the small droplets that have done more damage than the, the larger droplets. So there's a lot of information to, uh, to get from studying these specimens. But this is not the main topic of today. Um, but if we plot the four different um, configurations, uh, uh, drop sizes, uh, we can see this is the time to, to uh, damage and this is the speed. And you can see we get four different curves, um, but um, it's difficult to compare because they see different uh, rain rates, etc. So, but we can um, say uh, represented by what is called specific impact. So this is the number of impacts per area before you see the damage. And then well, I would say naturally, Maybe not naturally, but you see for larger droplets, it's uh, fewer drops. So this is 3.5, 2.4, 1.9, and the flow rate with the small droplets. So these require many more droplets per square, square meter, or this is per square millimeter before you see a damage. Um, but if you if you take the specific impacts de uh, spe uh, definition by HGM uh, G73, this is actually a number of impacts per area, which is equivalent to the projected area of one droplet. 
So there you see the curves move closer together, but still the larger droplets make more damage than the small droplets. Then if we uh, use a pre presentation, which is the in, in accumulated impacted water column, uh, also called impingement in the uh, old HGM standard, we can see that the curves move very close together. They actually overlap. But it's also clear here that there is a, uh, the, the curves have a different uh, slope in the, in the, uh, the diagram. So this is accumulated impacted water in meters, and this is the speed again on the vertical axis. Um, so, so how do we make a model where in the atmosphere we want to account for all the different droplet sizes and, and they are continu uh, continuously varying? So how do we account for that in a model where we want to predict life? So there are di different uh, ways to do this. The DNV, um, GL, uh, recommended practice uh, 01, uh, what is it, 171, I think. Uh, um, uh, or is it, no, sorry, the 573 five, <laughs> five, uh, recommended practice about evaluating rain erosion test results. They uh, propose a method to get from one drop size to another. Uh, based on uh, Springer's model and some uh, analysis from that. Um, so that is a method when you have tested only one droplet size, then to get to the other ones. And if we look at the blue curve here, that is the average uh, uh, fatigue curve or rain erosion curve for the 2.4 millimeters. And then if we shift that according to the DNV method, we get this dotted curve for 1.9 and the red dotted curve for 3.5 and the green dotted curve for the small droplets. And, and the, the solid curves corresponding are our experimental results. So you can see that the using this DNV uh, methodology, we get the right trend. We move the curves in the right direction, but not really. Yeah, this is a fairly good match. But you see that this method does not account for the slope. So uh, the smaller slope for smaller droplets and higher slope for larger droplets, we don't get that from this method. So what we did was that we took the uh, the four uh, um, uh, power curves for the four drop sizes and measures uh, M exponent for each, which uh, corresponds to the slope. And then we can get a, a S-shaped function where this is the Wöhler exponent M and, and uh, this is the drop size. And then um, we applied this to, to a function where we can uh, uh, so it's a mathematical expression that we can use in our lifetime predictions. And again, now these the dotted curves here are the functions or the yeah, uh, uh, according to this function, and the solid curves are um, are the experimental data. So uh, you can see the fit is not very good, but the trend is there, and and we should also say that. There's a lot of scatter in rain erosion test results, so if you really want to get very reliable curves, you have to test even more than we did. Um, but still, we use this uh, method to uh, to uh, to um, to predict erosion One life. Sorry. One minute. Yeah, erosion life at a number of different size sites in northern Europe. And we can see if we use just the uh, erosion curve for the for the standard configuration of 2.4 or 38 millimeters, we get uh, average lives ranging from uh, one and a half at Ushira up to 11 years at Seehausen, which is a very uh, not so uh, um, severe erosion environment. If we use our continuous function, taking into account the drop sizes, we get much longer lifetimes. Um, 
And finally, we have here plotted the um, the damage, erosion damage that you see per precipitation, just to illustrate that uh, um, if you say you have 700 millimeters of rain, this is not enough to predict how much erosion you will have. You have to take into account the the concurrent measures of, of wind that translate into rotor speed. So, so um, you can say, see here in Bilon and uh, Seehausen, you have very little erosion per uh, meter of precipitation. And at Utsira, Skagen, Helgoland, some of these offshore parks, you have three times as much uh, damage per, per meter of measured precipitation. So uh, yeah, just a few, uh, three uh, headlines. So uh, we found that this uh, impingement or accumulated uh, impacted rain is the most convenient uh, parameter to for um, uh, representing the rain erosion results. And we have developed an empirical model to uh, through a transfer uh, between uh, <coughs> drop sizes on the VN curves. And then the erosion damage varies significantly per meter of rain, uh, depending on the site. Thank you. OK, Jacob, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I see we have a challenge with, uh, with the drops. We'll see how we manage that in the future. Uh, I have a question here uh, mm -hmm. from uh, uh, Arno. Uh, Arno, are you with us? You want to speak loud voice or you want me to read? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Um, hi, Jacob. Thanks for the presentation. Hello. It's really what? interesting. But um, in the end, what you did is, OK, we had some various models and then we had to do a curve fit because otherwise the results wouldn't really work. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way that we can get to a model that makes like physical sense? Uh, yes, uh, I'm also working on, uh, we are working on that on different uh, levels. I, I have a say simple um, model based on simple assumptions that give the similar trends for the for the drop sizes, but we also uh, but it is uh, it does not really take into account uh, layers in the structure, etc. And then we're working on fine element model to account more precisely. So we are running in parallel, yeah, simple model and more advanced models so we can see that trends uh, trends uh, fit. But but it's difficult, you can it's really difficult to make a global model because these correlations depend strongly on the actual leading edge configuration. So uh, the, uh, the the properties of the coatings or, or shells and the thickness etc. So it's difficult to make a global one. So you still have to to do a lot of testing <laughs> to match it. Okay, thank you. Um, I have here another question. Uh, it's, well, we have two. Uh, Beatriz sent me one. I have another one here that uh, are related um, are related to the way of uh, testing. I guess the system that you show us the is the helicopter system, and. Um, in uh, one of the question is uh, okay we some of us we know that this is the the closest system uh, um, to reality but how close is to reality do we do we know the fidelity of these systems against the the rain that we really see in the wind farm um it's it's definitely not the same because uh, we we uh, test as a at a uh, for uh, uh, more or less uniform size of droplets, and in the and and if we we can also try to ch uh, test with different configurations, but in the in the field you see continuously a distribution of drop sizes, uh, and we don't know exactly how that affects uh, the erosion uh, damage compared to uh, exposing with the uniform drop sizes. Okay. So. Yeah. I guess with uh, further data from uh, uh, wind farms, real wind, actual wind farms, uh, we will we will uh, improve, let's say, this relation no? from the testing to to the real site. I guess we're working we're working on that. Another 
danger is of course the accelerated testing that you test at uh, typically test at a quite high test uh, test speeds to get a say quick result but you may activate some non-realistic damage modes so um, okay. yeah okay so it's important to test also at at uh, velocities down to the relevant velocities for the rotors in question so below 100 meters per second yeah 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 these tests may take weeks <laughs> sometimes. Ooh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacob. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, as uh, we said before, uh, uh, the whole workshop is is going uh, is recorded, so uh, it will be posted then, and uh, anyone could uh, uh, access to your presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on uh, to the next uh, presentation. Uh, I don't know if uh, Josue Enriquez uh, is uh, with us because uh, he's in Mexico and uh, now the time in Mexico, I think is like two in the morning. So Josue, uh, are you with us? Yeah, 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 of course I am here. Well, of course, uh, what time is in Mexico? 2, 2 a.m. <laughs> oh my God. We have to really yeah. thank you to participate. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, if I have to say uh, something uh, from you, uh, Jake, uh, no, sorry, not Jacob, Joshua, um, you're currently working uh, as the CEO and uh, researcher at the AP Engineering. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't know if you want to say something else about your position and then go ahead with the presentation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, AP, AP Engineering is uh, a company so that we uh, create here in Mexico. It's about to service, maintaining service. Uh, so we we in farms uh, here in Oaxaca State. Uh, we are near to La Ventosa. We are in Istepec, Oaxaca, uh, 20, minutes, 20 minutes to, to La Ventosa. So we have some projects for companies like Vestas, uh, Gamesa, Revergy. Yeah. And, and we are trying to work about to uh, research in, in, in wind energy. And in this case, I am um, a research uh, level one in the national, the national research in, in Mexico. So um, in this case, uh, we are uh, we are working about to wind turbine blade, right? Um, okay. Okay. So um, Joshua, today uh, I think uh, we're going to be talking about the leading edge erosion defect uh, forecasting and its coupling to wind uh, farm control. Is that uh, no? Sorry, sorry, I'm getting wrong. No, 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 no. no. Uh, sorry, uh, aerodynamic and uh, model analysis of the wind turbine blade uh, caused by the effect of erosion. Preliminary yeah. preliminary experimental results. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so Joshua, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, show us. Yeah, sure. Wait a minute. Uh, wait, wait, uh, I'm looking for... yeah. yeah, we can see the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to start, right? Uh, I'm sorry, so, so maybe my English is not so good, but I'm going to try to right? explain about this our research. Yeah, and, and thank you for coming today. Um, this presentation is about to aerodynamic and model analysis of wind turbine blades caused by the effect of erosion. So, in this preliminary result, uh, we try to get information about to wind turbine blades in, in experimental platform. So, I got. I don't know what happened. You can see still no, the presentation. Uh, we lost uh, your screen. I don't know why exactly. Yeah. Uh, there, there you go. Yeah, again. You're uh, okay. Fine, huh? Okay. Oh, I don't know what happened. It's because you're on the last slide. You have to take yeah. the first picture. Wait. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay, right. Ooh, this is the content. Okay, thank you. This is the content of the presentation. We have a, a very brief introduction, uh, problem statement, uh, aerodynamic analysis, 
So structural analysis, in this case, we are we're gonna talk about the model analysis, uh, preliminary, preliminary experimental results, um, a brief discuss, discussion, and some reference about this um, preliminary work. In this case, the introduction, when uh, uh, we decide to talk about to the, the importance about the renewable, renewable so, uh, research. So in this case, uh, uh, this uh, uh, we try to, you know, uh, um, get the importance about to the cinetic energy uh, caused by the wind. And in the actual uh, designs of the wind turbine blade, uh, try to try to support several loads, several loads uh, over over the surface. In this case, uh, in the wind turbine blade, and, and consider the the root, you know, uh, or 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 consider uh, the the all the wind turbines in this case the, the ground uh, to the tip of the wind turbine blade. All the all the system is most most support uh, several lots over the structures. Right. So in this case, um, in particular, uh, the the wind turbine blade uh, is exposed to several uh, environmental factors. Uh, in, should have rain, some rain, incense, and some rain. So all these uh, components uh, cause uh, uh, several damage on the surface. Uh, node has erosion, yeah? in particular the erosion. This uh, principal problem is, is located on the leading edge uh, of the wind turbine blade and for both, both sides, up and down. And this uh, particular uh, work present a study uh, considering the, emul uh, the emulation of erosion in the, the, the wind turbine blade caused by the rain and the sand, sand rain. So this uh, emulation is uh, necessary for, for us to try to, uh, to get an uh, aerodynamic analysis and uh, using a Cubelate software. So we design a particular method methodology uh, in this uh, presentation. Maybe we're not going to talk about so much about this uh, methodology, but it, we are focused only on the results. The presence, the presence of erosion in a wind turbine blade uh, can cause a, a, a change in the uh, power power coefficient of the wind turbine and uh, induce an unbalance, unbalance causing a, a vibration problem uh, due to the loss of material in the surface of the wind turbine blade. Right, so. This uh, variation uh, is is um, it can be can be um, we we can observe this uh, this problem uh, through uh, experimental results using a, a wind turbine blade of of a wind turbine of one kilo kilowatt uh, of power. So. A problem statement when this in this war we consider parameters of wind measurement uh, in the ISMO of Tehuantepet in Oaxaca state. And in this case, the nominal speed is around of H uh, meters per, per second. The levels of erosion emulate in Q blade was in a percentage around uh, of 12 uh, uh, 18 per percentage. Uh, the wind turbine blade design consists in a wind turbine of one kilowatt of power. So um, finally, we show some case of the literature uh, with erosion caused by rain and sand grade. It is a uh, some pit uh, about uh, this uh, problem, you know, pitting, cracking, elimination, uh, caused by the uh, um, Presence of uh, rain and sun, sun rain, and in particular in the leading edge of the play. This is another peak about it. In this case, 
uh, the black zone represent the maximum erotic dip in, in this peak. Okay? The objective, uh, this will provide a methodology to evaluate the damage in the surface of section in a wind turbine blade due to the erosion caused by the rain and sun rays. This uh, methodology consists in the emulation of some levels of erosion, evaluating the, the aerodynamic and structural performance of the wind turbine blade, and uh, which can, can be useful to determine the negative effects in the extraction of maximum power of the structural health monitoring of the wind turbine blade. And this is uh, the objective of this, uh, of this work, this preliminary result. So the first, the first um, part of this uh, this uh, presentation, uh, we, we we talk about aerodynamic analysis. This uh, peak uh, represent a uh, wind turbine blade of one kilowatt. In this case, we use um, Cubelate software, you know, to get uh, this uh, this design. And in this case, we consider three different profiles. Uh, uh, and I, I don't remember, maybe NACA is uh, uh, the, um, the profiles uh, in, in the design of the uh, wind turbine blade. And um, we consider a 14 case of study. We, we or, or in this case, for the time, we, we just wanna wanna show we gonna show some 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 case right about it. So. Um, in this case, the procedure to emulate the erosion, uh, we, we consider a, a special section or a particular section of the wind turbine blade. In this case, in the uh, red color, you know, represent this damage section or damage area. And um, in this case, uh, for the analysis, uh, we consider uh, the section in and the fold or, or fold uh, in the up and down uh, of, of the wind turbine blade, right? Uh, in the first, uh, first case, we consider the down edge, you know, and, and the peak, uh, the, the figure, figure we can uh, observe uh, how we represent the uh, erosion, you know, by, uh, through the software. Right in this case, the the blue line, uh, the blue 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 line, represent uh, the <clears throat> represent a percentage of of that match through the software, right? And the uh, 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 black uh, line is uh, a clean uh, wind turbine blade, right? And I don't know if you can see uh, the colors. Sorry. So and. For this case, we use uh, uh, the, the software and get uh, the, the, the relationship between CD and CL uh, coefficient of the of the wind turbine blade. So in, in this figure, in the figure six, we consider uh, in, in this case several uh, case. In this case. Uh, for example, uh, eight, uh, fold H, fold H zero, fold H one represent a different percentage of uh, 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 emulation of of erosion over the over the uh, uh, wind turbine blade, and uh, the um, blue line represent uh, in this case. Uh, the wind turbine blade, but, but in this case, the clean, you know, in the, in, or the wind turbine blade. So in, in the figure seven, we can observe the relationship uh, between CL, uh, this angle, right? So we observe a, a change, right? In different percentage of the match, uh, the aerodynamic uh, um, performance of the, of the wind turbine blade. Just consider the down eight, and we have a table, uh, a comparison of the lift attract of coefficient, in the, in this different case, right? In this in this case, consider an angle of ten degree. Yeah. This is the uh, figure that represent the power 
power coefficient and compare the clean uh, wind turbine plate and and uh, just uh, one case of the uh, erosion, right? And, uh, a level of a percentage of the erosion, right? We can see uh, uh, two figures. Uh, the second of, of the um, the right right uh, section or right figure represent uh, is a zoom, right? Of, of the figure of the of the left uh, left left side. Right. This is another uh, a figure about the maximum power of, of the same uh, case, right? You can see a difference in this, of this uh, maximum power. This is the second case is about to the up edge in the same uh, area of, of, the, of where we consider uh, the, 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 the damage uh, due to the erosion, right? So in this case, we can see uh, uh, a uh, blue line, blue line, right? Represent this uh, erosion, and uh, the the other line represent uh, the clean, the clean uh, area of the wind turbine plate. Yeah. In the similar about to the first case, uh, is uh, different percentage of the match, right? And and uh, we can see the difference, you know, the, uh, the performance of the of the of the wind turbine plate, right? CD bits CL and CL bits uh, angle, right? We have uh, here uh, we have we have here uh, a second table, and with this case, second case, right? We we we, we can observe some change of this uh, coefficient, a uh, power coefficient equal, equal change. Same case, uh, maximum power. This is a third, third case. Consider the up and down edge. You know, we, we can observe in the in the figure uh, 15, right? The both case, both uh, edge, sorry. And we have a, a here um, and similar figures and, and uh, represent the case uh, one, two, one and two, right? Just wait two minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. And, and we have a performance of the wind turbine. We can observe in this case uh, how change uh, the uh, coefficient power. You know, in this case we have zero point one four four one forty one, right? So uh, here represent um, uh, the wind turbine wake. You know, we uh, we consider this erosion change 0 0.39, 39. So uh, the structural analysis, in this, case, in this case, the model analysis, we have here uh, uh, in the first, uh, 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 first uh, case, uh, use a uh, uh, finite, finite element model, right? We have the properties of the material so that we use in the, in, the, in the analysis using ANSYS, ANSYS work range. We have the another parameters in the processing, processing of formation. We have here uh, in the case of down edge, the first and second model frequency. We have here, for example, a cooperation of a model frequency, right? And different case uh, or, or percentage of the match, right? This is the case of the up edge, right? Similar case, we have a table comparison of model frequency. The up and down, you no, know, it will equal operation of, of table. And we have preliminary experimental result using a electromagnetic uh, shaker in this configuration. Uh, use an accelerometer and the wind turbine plate and uh, in pedant's hands uh, to try to excite uh, the wind turbine plate. Right? This, uh, we have here uh, a, um, a, a figure with the response of the system using an impact hammer. No, in this case, uh, the uh, frequencies uh, are lineal. But in another case, is the experimental response uh, using electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic shaker. In this case, the second um, uh, frequency represents a nonlinear uh, um, frequency of, this, of the system. Right? 
So we have a key, a, a, we, 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 have, uh, we, we have, sorry, a comparison of the frequency response. Consider a finite element, experimental hammer and experimental shaker, yeah? right? And the uh, three first um, uh, um, mode uh, of, of resonant frequency of, of, the, of the wind turbine plate. Uh, results of this crucial, uh, we have like, a new proportional of methodology for the emulation of the match in a wind turbine blade. I've said by the Roshan using Quebec software. Numerical experimental result, considering in this case the aerodynamic and structural of the performance in the wind turbine blade, considering the emulation uh, of the match in different, different areas of the leading edge. Uh, in this case, this analysis uh, is useful for us to try to get a database on negative air effect of erosion of the wind turbine blades. And we try to use this information to design optimization techniques for the detection of the mash in real wind turbine blades. blades. So, uh, uh, that's all. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no, uh, Joshua, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, yeah. A very quick question I have uh, when I was uh, listening and uh, looking to your presentation. I see that the, uh, all the study that you have been uh, going through is with uh, uh, one kilowatt uh, wind turbine and yeah. uh, the blade, uh, it will be about one meter or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how um, how do you expect uh, if the analysis, for example, uh, for the structural part, uh, will be proportional when we consider blades of uh, 30, 40, 50 meters? Uh, well, in this case, uh, mm, it's possible, you know, to use uh, this preliminary result to try to to use in another um, another. Uh, Kind of or or, or wind turbine blade, you know. Um, but uh, for us in this case, it, it is is uh, that is complicated because we we don't have a you know a a, a, a great uh, laboratory, right? For that, uh, but the result uh, most most work with another kind of, of wind turbine blade. Okay, okay, yes, well. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting and. Uh, I will be saying the same thing uh, after all presentations that this uh, whole uh, workshop is uh, recorded. So anyone that can uh, access to you, it will have all the data and uh, they could uh, see your presentation again. So thank you very much, Josue. And also you. for your dedication at this time uh, of night in Mexico. Thank you. Great. Thank you okay. very much. See you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on on the next uh, block, our next uh, technical session that uh, it will be on control. Uh, our first uh, presenter is uh, Charlotte by Hasseger. Um, Charlotte uh, belongs, well, works in the DTU as a professor in the offshore wind energy methodology with ex uh, expertise in remote sensing boundary layer methodology and many other things but I, because I also know um, Charlotte and uh, we know uh, she's a senior researcher with a lot of experience. Uh, Charlotte, are you with us? Yes, I guess uh, Charlotte, we, we, I think we have seen your, uh, your presentation but I cannot hear you. I don't know the rest of the audience. Okay, I have to unmute. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, but I can't uh, do both at the same time. So, okay, okay. I'll share again. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. Welcome. Uh, I think uh, today we can have a presentation about the version safe mode control demonstration. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank to see you. you again, even though it's uh, by a camera, but uh, very pleased to see you again. And uh, thank you very much for participating in this workshop. I leave you the floor. Uh, please thank go you. ahead uh, with your presentation. Okay, so is it visible my yeah, slide yeah, it's visible it's Good. perfect now and we can hear you okay yes so i will present this uh, morning about erosion safe mode control demonstration 
I have many co-authors from DTU and Danish Meteorological Institute. Um, so the project is erosion project is about uh, understanding the the rain impacting the blades. Number one. Number two, uh, use the rain erosion test, which Jakob just explained us uh, half an hour ago. <clears throat> and next, it is number three, to find an instrument that can sit on a turbine and give a rain warning. And number four is the control algorithm in the turbine to slow down when the rain is heavy. Um, so here I just show this uh, graphic from Jakob. The time on the x-axis, the rounds per minute uh, on the y-axis, and then when we have high wind speeds, we have uh, high rounds per minute, a fast turbine. Now, if a rain hits like uh, shown here, we want to reduce the rounds per minute during this period. That is erosion safe mode. We want to do this demonstration at the Aberdeen Bay wind farm together with Vattenfall, they own this wind farm. You can see here it's located in Scotland offshore. It is um, V164, 8.8 megawatt turbines, and yeah, some data about the turbines. What we want to do is to operate uh, two turbines, you can say. The one to the left, we want to do erosion safe, operation to slow down and the other one to the right will be in standard operation uh, as the other turbines as well. Now we want to first uh, apply an erosion indicator coding at the leading edges of these two turbines and we want to monitor uh, yeah, the progression of erosion through time. That's the technical implementation already know is what uh, paint we want to add and we have put that on a specimen, well several specimen and that has been in rain erosion test already and we have VN curves of this uh, indicator paint. That obviously is a less good uh, leading edge protection than usual so that we sooner can see a damage. So this is like an experiment. Then the other technical implementation is we want to add a micro rain radar at the nacelle of one turbine. The micro rain radar is this instrument that you see at the bottom uh, with a disc and it's sending up a radar pulse in the air every few <laughs> seconds and it is watching the raindrops as they fall from high altitude, say 1000 meters or five, uh, and when and every 50 meters we see the raindrops and then we'll have a little time to react and start the control in due time. If I show you the data from a micro rain radar, you can see it to the right here. At the upper panel you see reflectivity, which is a backscatter value, sort of the raw signal from the instrument. Uh, the higher it is, the more it scatters on uh, something up in the air. The next uh, panel is the fall velocity. It shows you in meter per second with a color scale uh, how fast things are falling, aerosols or particles are falling. The, the quicker mo movement are of, well, if there's hail, it's very fast. If it's rain or big drops, it's faster than smaller drops and so on. And at the base, you see rain intensity. That is a calculated property out from reflectivity and fall velocity, so a derived product. At the x-axis, we have one hour from five o'clock to six o'clock on this particular day. What I would like to highlight now is that it seems like everything is a bit skewed. It's falling uh, uh, to the side, so to say. So if you watch this black line I just included here, you see we see something high in the atmosphere at two kilometers <clears throat> and a bit later we see it at the surface. <coughs> Sorry. 
And this little time shift between when we see something falling first time high up and to it reaches down, we have a couple of minutes, two or three minutes. That's the horizontal black line. That's the little time we have to react uh, and use this information. Another a priori knowledge we need uh, is to understand what is the expected rain and wind at this site. We have no data available, so instead we have been doing a comparison of precipitation at a Danish station, weather station, and Scottish weather stations on land. We also have a numerical model. Um, so the precipitation observations in Scotland are, are shown right here to the left and to the right you see uh, the curves of rain during the months, uh, January, February, March, and the precipitation sums per month. Uh, notice that the green and the blue are Scottish sites, actually not the one closest to the turbine. The turbine is this uh, yellow uh, star. Uh, but it's the north and the south stations because the station in the middle is actually in some rather high mountain, well, hills, so it's not representative of this offshore. Uh, the red curve is from the Danish side in the North Sea shore. And we see that in spring, April, May, we have lower winds, uh, no, rain, uh, then later in the summer and autumn we have more rain. So the stations looking rather similar. Uh, we also have uh, compared these in a different way where we say the rain rate or, uh, on the x-axis and how many percentage of time is the levels exceeded. And what you only need to understand here is the, the three curves are following each other very well in the four seasons we, we looked at, autumn, winter, summer, spring. This was all to say that we kind of think the Danish site uh, measurements are useful to uh, assume that the rain near the wind farm is, is similar. I spent that much time about the rain because if we are looking at rain at a, the base and we see a, a typical rain amount uh, at a, a site in Northern Europe could be 0.7 meter of rain per year. Now, the turbine would uh, definitely get much more rain on the blades because they are moving through this uh, water in the air, the rain. And if it moves at about 90 meter per second and it's at rated speed, the blade would actually meet or be impinged by about 10 meters of water and not only 0.7 meters. So you can say the turbines are magnifying the way rain is actually observed or, or, or you could say impacting. And this is why we really need to understand this rain. Well, it, the, if there's a little error, there'll also be a larger error in the air about what we actually see happening at a turbine. Um, then a few words about the erosion safe mode. We need, first of all, precipitation and wind conditions at site. Uh, and then to the left, we in need to include the damage modeling that Jakob showed, the VN curves. And then we need the revenue optimization. That means how much money do you earn? What's the repair cost? What's the uh, yeah, loss of energy due to a rougher blade and so on? And all of that goes into the safe mode control operation uh, where and in an iterative process we can find out what would then be a, a wise way of curtailing the turbine during rain events because then we can balance all these uh, numbers uh, to each other. So we have this software. Now I'm moving on to say at Hvide Sande, the Danish station, we have 18 years of 10 minute values of rain intensity and wind speed. And then we can make an assessment of if uh, we are thinking the erosion safe mode demonstration starts in May, 
And if we want to see results by September, five months later, and we want to uh, yeah, curtail so much that we are sure that there's nearly no damage on one turbine, the control turbine, but there's some damage on the other turbine because that's not controlled. And then we have to see how many episodes do we have if the rain is above 0.6 millimeter per hour, 1.2 millimeter, 3 millimeter, 10 millimeter. That we then include to the VN curves and the damage model and, and are thinking how much uh, damage will happen. If we use uh, 1.2 millimeter per hour as a threshold, we would have about 77 hours where we would curtail the turbine. And uh, out of those, it is wind speeds above 6.8 meter per second. If we assume the winds are also the same at this site as in Vilsane, then it would uh, end up in about 43 hours where we would really curtail because we only need to curtail if RPMs are high. Okay, it can be raining, but if it's not windy, we don't curtail anyway. So now we are down to 1.8 days in a sum with uh, happening through time. Uh, another way of showing these things are, uh, here we see uh, the samples of 10 minute rainfall uh, on the y-axis you have rain millimeter per hour, and on the y-axis, x-axis you have just all the samples. And now the red line is the threshold. That means if we are thresholding at 10 millimeter per hour, it will be the higher, the one to the left. If we are thresholding at a much lower value, I think that was a one millimeter or, or 0 0.6 millimeter per hour uh, rain, then we'll have many more episodes where we will control the turbine. So these are the balances of where to exactly put this red line uh, compared to what we want to demonstrate. So I think we can say that uh, one way of operating the turbine could be to use a rain rate of one millimeter per hour in 10 minute intervals. That means, uh, well, I, I forgot to mention the micro rain radar is measuring at a one minute, minute resolution. So we could also, instead of a 10 minute interval, which our other rain data are, we could operate at a one millimeter per hour in one or two minute intervals. That means we'll see the rain before it hits. We could operate as long as we see high enough values and then stop curtailing. We don't want, but some rain is intermittent. So you see heavy rain for a few minutes, then a drop, and then suddenly it goes up again. So maybe instead of go curtailing, and not curtailing at a one minute, maybe two minutes interval. Uh, and also if we see hail, which we can see because the fall velocity is really high, we could stop the turbine. That would definitely save on, on lifetime. Um, so we have many challenges. One is to get the micro rain radar installed, to paint the blades, to monitor regularly and also to make these control settings without knowing the rain and wind very well uh, is a challenge. But it's of course exciting to overcome the challenges and demonstrate it. And I should mention, we are just demonstrating that we can see a difference between a controlled turbine and a non-controlled turbine. We are not going to optimize at this time. That would be another project where we would really say, uh, how should we optimize it compared to all the cost model functions? Okay. If you're interested in more of our work, we have these uh, many literatures already published about it. And thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Sorry, Shama, uh, I thought you were finished. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, we have... Uh, some questions, a few of them. Uh, first one in the chat is from uh, Mehir, uh, Michael Major. Uh, hi, Charlotte. What is the minimal detectable defect size on the blade with the ground based camera defect indicator code? Okay, that's a very good question. Actually, it may be it's a drone or a man in a rope. I just uh, draw it as a camera. Uh, 
So I think we can say it will be as usual. Uh, the inspection quality will be as usual for inspections um, in this case. But I don't know with the exact camera how good it can be. It's difficult to use a camera on the ground because uh, of the sunlight. Uh, and uh, okay, the paint will have a color. So the, the contrast be between the, the painting and, and the usual LEP, which is still there, uh, is quite high. So I think the camera can be not too bad, but yeah. Okay. Um, then we have another one uh, is very focusing in the control is internal one from my colleagues from Fener and it says, uh, for how long will this test need to be running in order to demonstrate the effectivity of the control strategy? Yeah, um, we know the indicator paint is much worse uh, LEP protection than the usual one. So we hope to see something in a year's time. Uh, of course, it depends on what time of season, because uh, summer and autumn, we have lots of rain. So we think at that time we will have some erosion where we see the difference between using safe mode and not. But if we only start at a time when we have little rain, like March, April, May, we have little rain and not the highest winds. And that's not where erosion is the harshest. So it's more important uh, at what time of the year we start mm -hmm. and then to be operating when we have the worst uh, weather conditions. But I think one year. OK, OK, that's good. Uh, good timing. Uh, we have another one in the chat from uh, Alexander Mayer Forstein. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, what about the cloud base height? height? Uh, it will change the preview time for the reaction. Does this matter? Uh, how about blade-based rain detectors? Yes, uh, very nice. Uh, I should have mentioned. Of course, the micro rain radar can also watch up to three or four kilometers if we want, but we will uh, set it low, maybe at a thousand meters, exactly to ignore too much uh, the cl cloud base. As you know, clouds uh, usually contain frozen material, uh, and as it falls, it will melt and be rain. So we would like to see its rain and not uh, snow or frozen material. When the cloud base is really near the surface in a very few meters above, what well, I mean, fog is like basically the cloud base at the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't know much about that, and it's not necessarily raining when you have a cloud on the base. Uh, but we can, well, the turbine is 120 meters. I think we will use signals from about 600 meters, uh, 500, 400, 300, and then use those intervals, and most rain will be melted by then. Well, most precipitation will be melted and be rain. But it's clear that there can be weather systems where it's very difficult. The next is, could we use, for instance, a, a LiDAR uh, sitting on the turbine? And I guess we could say yes. Uh, it's not as a mature uh, instrument because it's not like on the shelf that you use a wind LiDAR to sit on the turbine yeah. and then give the rain signal. But technically, yes. And the last I should mention is the Parseval instrument, which is like a laser-based uh, instrument, but it's a very fragile instrument. It will never survive to sitting on top of a turbine. Uh, so we need a robust instrument, basically. Okay. Well, uh, this last uh, explanation that you you just gave us, uh, it was I had a question on the last minute or for myself, and uh, I was also curious to to see. Uh, with what method and uh, how and where we were going to measure the rain when we are in the one in the wind farm to then activate the control, uh, the control mode, safe control mode, because this is going to be a lot of money in the offshore wind farms. Yes, if we imagine we need to put a micro rain radar on every turbine, it would really be costly. But if we imagine we put one at uh, every 10 turbines, or if a very large turbine, maybe one in each corner, mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then uh, connect intelligently all turbines uh, to these in a very large turbine, say a 20 by 20 kilometer uh, wind farm. We often have that it's raining in the north part and not in the south, or yeah. it is progressing through. Yeah. So we would use, um, uh, yeah, we would use uh, real weather radars from the weather services that are producing these uh, rains every five minutes. Yeah. and predicting in due time with a five minute interval, where is it really coming? And then our local radars, micro rain radars, or maybe lidars, they are probably cheaper, but I don't sell them and there's none available. But you could imagine a slightly cheaper instruments as we use right now. You put on a few turbines and connect them together. And from that you maybe operate five or 10 turbines with one of the sensors and another sensor and so on. And then you could uh, lower the cost. Okay, Charles, thank you very much. Uh, You're very, welcome. very interesting, and I think uh, there's a lot of uh, work to go further yeah. on in this. We're not done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will follow you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're gonna move on on the next uh, presentation. Let me check uh, what we have uh, for next presentation. Is uh, Jens uh, Bisbeck, uh, Madsen, and uh, are you with us, uh, Jens? Yes. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Uh, Jens is a PhD student in the Department of uh, Wind Energy. Uh, he works, uh, is specialized in systems engineering and optimization. And uh, I guess your presentation today, uh, you already put it in there. Uh, so you, everybody can read the title, Leading Edge Erosion Defect uh, Forecasting and its Coupling to Wind Farm Control. Wonderful. Uh, I leave the floor for you and uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yes, so uh, my name is uh, Jens and I started as a PhD student at DTU back in uh, October, where my main uh, focus of study is going to be uh, implementing different AI approaches uh, in the context of uh, leading edge erosion. And today I will be giving a presentation on uh, the topic leading edge erosion defect forecasting and how it is coupled to uh, wind farm control. So this presentation is part of a larger project called Blade Defect Forecasting. Uh, which is a collaboration uh, between DTU and Wind Power Lab and DMI. So Wind Power Lab is a Danish company uh, that specializes in uh, blade defect assessment and blade uh, risk management. And DMI is the uh, Danish Meteorological Institute. And the project is uh, funded by uh, Innovation Fund Denmark. <clears throat> so this is the outline for, uh, for my presentation today. Initially, I will just uh, briefly introduce uh, the project itself. Uh, what are the motivations for doing this project and uh, the expected um, outcomes? Then I will uh, describe the data that we've been using for the modeling. And I will uh, describe the models uh, itself and how it's uh, validated. Then I will show some of the uh, results that we have. And, and then I will give a, uh, a coupling to uh, how this work can be used in a wind farm control um, framework. So we know that leading edge erosion uh, accounts for a major part of the unplanned uh, uh, repairs, uh, which is a huge uh, oper operational expense. Uh, and it's caused by the, uh, the wind turbine maintenance plans typically being based on assumption of, of uh, the weather conditions. So obviously uh, this requires uh, site specific plate maintenance planning. Uh, and this is uh, the case for both uh, wind farms that are being planned uh, new sites and also uh, wind farms that are already operating. So the objectives of this uh, project is to develop this uh, blade defect forecasting tool or model, which can be used to estimate uh, expected defects based on, uh, on environmental parameters. And this allows us to identify the relations between how fast the blade uh, degrades uh, with the, uh, with the environmental uh, conditions and also what is the initial state of the blade, uh, how fast does it degrade uh, based on these uh, inputs. So finally, we would like to make a, a database that contains the relevant parameters, which can be used to make a, an erosion map uh, across Northern Europe uh, that can be used for assessing uh, the uh, leading edge erosion potential at different sites. So here I've just showed the um, sort of the overall modeling problem based on the data that we have available. So we have some uh, uh, mesoscale weather data 
and we have some plate inspections and we want to try and, and figure out a way of modeling uh, these two so say mapping uh, the uh, the damages observed at uh, the turbines with the weather that it has uh, that it has seen so here is the proposed uh, modeling workflow uh, for this uh, process and i will talk a bit, a bit uh, more detail about each of these uh, blocks but this is just to to give an indication of um, of how the framework looks and how the each of the uh, the two data types are sort of fed into this uh, workflow. So the weather data that we have available is uh, provided by DMI uh, from their uh, model Harmony, and it's uh, we have data from uh, 106 different sites uh, located uh, in northern Europe, seen by the uh, by the red dots on the left uh, map here. So the data are a mesoscale with a horizontal resolution of 2.5 kilometers and a temporal resolution of one hour. And the data are given in two different formats. Uh, we have uh, the precipitation given as uh, accumulated hourly surface fields, and we have the wind given as model level fields at different heights. So uh, the rain and the wind on their own uh, might not be uh, that important, but it's the combination of wind and rain that sort of causes or drives the, the erosion. And uh, to uh, compute this combination of wind and rain, we use uh, the impingement model, which uh, sort of tells how much rain uh, hits the tip of the blade. And the impingement model takes as inputs a time series of rain, and it takes a time series of wind, and then some uh, simplistic rotor speed curve uh, to compute the, the, uh, the tip speed and the impact velocity at the tip. And then it gives a single value uh, if you feed it a sequence of, uh, of weather uh, data and you compute the impingement, then you can, you can sum up all the contributions from the different time steps and then you get a single value uh, representing the rain impingement, which is going to be used as an input uh, for the model. So in, terms of, in terms of blade inspections, uh, we have 12 inspections performed on seven different uh, wind farms located in Northern Europe. The inspections are provided by Wind Power Lab and they cover uh, 678 different blades uh, which, with more than 14,000 defects observed on the leading edge. So obviously we're only looking at, um, at defects on the leading edge for this particular project. So each defect is uh, categorized by a defect type and severity, uh, and I'll show these uh, different uh, categories on the next slide. Um, and for each uh, inspection, uh, we can set up a sequence. So if we take, that's what I've shown uh, in the table on the right side here. So if we look at, for instance, wind farm number two, we know that that wind farm was commissioned in 2016, and we had two different inspections performed on this wind farm. We had one in 18 and one in 19. So that is, uh, naturally gives us two sequences. So one from 16 to 18 with an initial starting damage of zero, because that's when it was commissioned, and then we had an inspection in 18, where we now have uh, a damaged state of the wind farm. The same goes for 19. We can make a sequence from 16 to 19, and we can make a sequence between the two inspections, between 18 and 19. So we know that uh, we now have an initial starting damage that is represented by the inspections performed in 18. And then we had the weather condition for that year causing an increase in, in, uh, in, in damage uh, that we see in the inspection in 2019. So in total, uh, this gives us 18 different samples that can be used uh, for modeling, where we have this sequence of weather data that we would like to map uh, the, uh, the damage data with. So based or because we have our mesoscale weather data uh, with the resolution that it has, uh, we can't distinguish between individual turbines. So we, we need to, to figure out a way of encoding a full wind farm inspection into a single numerical value that sort of uh, represents the state, the damage state of the wind farm and can be used as a target feature for our models. So our solution is that we assign a weight uh, to each of the defects, the, the different defect categories, which are shown on the, uh, on the table to the right here. And this weight should represent the urgency for repair. So uh, it should be understood that for a value of one, it's a critical defect that uh, uh, impose a, uh, a, uh, a critical um, a need for repair. And uh, uh, it, it's not uh, a good for the structure integrity of the blade. So that should be repaired uh, immediately. Whereas the lower weighted defects, 
is not necessarily repair required, but they do uh, pose a defect that will develop into a more severe defect at some point. So now that we have it uh, for each inspection, we have a distribution of, um, of defects observed for each blade. So what we can do is that we can, for each inspection, we can go through each blade and then we can take out the maximum observed defect or the defect with the highest weight. And, and so for each inspection, we would have a distribution of maximum defects. And based on this distribution, we can compute a single uh, encoded damage as the mean value, which represents the state, the damage state of the wind farm. What we also get from this is that we get a distribution of maximum defects. So we get a type and a severity, which is sort of uh, uh, conditioned by this encoded damage state. So we would expect different distribution as function of encoded damage state. So uh, how are we going to model um, this? So we have uh, quite a few number of data available. So what we uh, propose here is that we use a uh, leave two out split, which means that we have our 18 samples. And then we take out two samples for validation and we take out the other 16 for training. And we do this for all the unique combinations you can imagine based on these 18 samples. So in total, that gives us 153 sets of data sets, or you could say uh, data sets that we can use for training 153 different models. So this gives us an un unbiased training set for each of the models. Um, so we have 153 different models with the same architecture. I've shown the architecture on the right side here. And then we train these different models on different data sets. And then for each model, we can uh, get an output. And this output represents this combined output or the ensemble output. And based on all these outputs, we can compute a mean value of the ensemble output and we can get some variance of the uh, ensemble outputs. So the architect used for this uh, particular project is a feed forward uh, neural network with two hidden layers of 10 uh, neurons in each. And we take the two inputs, which is the computed accumulated impingement based on the sequence of weather data and the encoded damage at the start of the sequence. The output is the encoded damage uh, seen um, observed at the inspection. So if we look at the model performance, the left side is a, a purely data-driven model performance where we, for each of the 18 samples, so obviously we have 153 different models, uh, and when we evaluate uh, or, or validate the two samples left out, each of the 18 samples will, will be evaluated by a number of different models. And that is what is shown here. So on the y-axis, we have the prediction. Uh, so the dot indicates the, um, the mean, the ensemble mean of the predictions, whereas the uh, error bar indicates the standard deviation uh, from the different models that predict this particular sample. On the right-hand side, we have um, some physicality checks. So this is uh, our way of physically uh, uh, validating the model response over a given uh, input a variable space. So here on the left column, uh, we see the uh, predicted um, damage as function of sequence length. And we see that for a fixed uh, starting damage of zero, we will start at, uh, for a sequence length of, of zero, we will start at 0, 0.0 and then sort of increases um, in the case for these uh, three different wind farms. We have uh, less uncertainty when we start with an initial damage of zero because we have most of our samples with an initial damage of zero. So at the, at the plot uh, below, we have a fixed starting damage of 0 0.2. Uh, uh, and we now see that at the sequence start, we would have at least 0 0.2 as the predicted damage because that's our starting damage. And then we sort of uh, increase as the sequence becomes longer. And now we also have more uncertainty uh, uh, related to the modeling. On the, uh, on the top right corner, I've showed this weighing scheme, which gives you an indication to what the different value means in, in the context of, of defect categories. So this is uh, the results of the different um, sites that we have available, the 106 different sites. So the left-hand side shows the uh, predicted damage, the mean, ensemble mean, which gives the predicted damage um, for the different sites after a single year of operation. So we see that most of the sites don't have that severe damage after just a single year. We have some in the uh, southwest part, uh, the southwest coast of Norway, 
where we start to see uh, damage already after one year. On the right-hand side, we have the same plot just after a damage or a, uh, a five years of abrasion. And now we see that uh, especially the, the sites located on the uh, southwest part of, of Norway is uh, really critical already after five years. And most of the sites will start to experience uh, some damage after five years. But we, we clearly see the difference uh, between different sites, uh, which judges the importance of this uh, site-specific uh, maintenance planning. So uh, just to uh, mention some of the future works that we have uh, planned, I uh, have uh, divided it into a short-term uh, future work and long-term. So for the short-term, uh, we would like to have some more sites uh, for our erosion map, uh, so we get a better populated map and uh, better can identify the different um, locations that are prone to leading edge erosion. Also, we would like to better understand how to decode this uh, encoded damage state back to the expected distribution of defects. So what we can do and what we have been doing uh, so far is that we have used a uh, assumed a joint normal distribution of the defect type and the defect severity. And then we have sort of used the encoded damage to decode back to this uh, normal, joint normal distribution. However, uh, the, the defects are given as, uh, as a non-continuous uh, category, so, so it, it doesn't really apply. So, so we're looking at how to, uh, how to actually decode this back. And also, we would like to know a bit more about how the uncertainty propagates uh, through the model. So obviously, mesoscale weather data have some uncertainty uh, because it sort of represents the entire grid cell. So we would like to know uh, what does, uh, how sensitive is the model to variation in wind and rain. Some of the more long-term um, work is more inspections to better uh, quantify the uncertainty related to the model and also implement this defect forecasting model into a wind farm control framework. And I will briefly describe uh, this. So the concept of the, uh, this BDF tool for leading edge control is that we have our, uh, our model, the BDF tool, which takes this impingement value and the impingement uh, takes the rotor speed curve as an input. So actually the expected damage state that comes out of the BDF tool is directly related to the rotor speed curve. So we can set up an optimization uh, problem um, for a single wind turbine where we have a design variable that is the rotor speed curve, which we can change, and we have a rain threshold. So we can make a cost optimization based on these uh, values. So for a single wind turbine, we don't need to consider any effects on neighboring turbines or inter inter interaction between these. However, when we increase this control strategy to a wind farm level, we suddenly have uh, the rotor speed curves and rain thresholds in plural because we now have this combined wind turbine specific control where we can change these or optimize these control settings for each individual turbine, depending on where they're located, how their wakes interact, and how uh, the loads are changed for different, um, for different wind turbines. And that is some of the work that, uh, that's in the pipeline uh, for us. Okay, Jans. Yep. Thank you very much. Very interesting, uh, very good study. We have a... Uh... We have one question or a couple of questions. Let me check on the chat. Um, yes, uh, here, Caroline uh, Broad. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I have one question. Are the blades repaired when the erosion is detected? How do you take that into account in your work? And finally, uh, is uh, you take these repair times, does the defect repairs? This last part, I don't. This last part of the question, I, I don't understand it too good. But uh, however, the two per, the two first questions, uh, I think, are very interesting. Are the blades repaired when the erosion is detected? Uh, how do you take that into account in your work? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, the blade inspections are provided by Wind Power Lab, and their purpose is obviously to make uh, repair rec recommendations based on these inspections. So when the inspections are made. Uh, which is used for computing this encoded damage state, they are not repaired. If we know any repairs have been made on the turbines, we will remove those turbines from the, uh, from the analysis. So we're only looking at, at uh, non-repaired uh, 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 wind turbines. For instance, we know that in uh, one of the wind farms, we had a uh, significant repair campaign made. Uh, so we have shifted the uh, commissioning date. So we have Instead of starting the sequence at the commission date, we start the sequence at uh, the known date of the uh, repair campaign, and then we assume a zero uh, initial starting damage at that point. Okay. 
I okay. hope that answered uh, the question. Uh, I think, but uh, it's <laughs> maybe uh, uh, just just the last thing was uh, does um, th does the defect reappears after uh, the repair? Uh, we, we don't uh, we don't have any data available before repairs and after repairs, so we don't okay, know uh, okay. we don't know that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jens. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question from uh, Arno Winger in the chat, but uh, since since we are uh, right on time for the next uh, presentation, uh, I will ask you, Jens, please, if you can uh, uh, provide an answer for Arno. It would be nice, also. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, we have uh, now Harold van der Miguel Major. Uh, Harold, you are with us. You were from the beginning, I guess. No? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Harold uh, is a senior consultant in the wind energy at uh, TNO. Uh, he's going to present uh, the wind core project, uh, wind turbine control strategies to reduce living edge erosion. Is that right? That's right. Thank you very much, Antonio. Good of morning, course. all. And now we really can happy. see you. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy that I can share the results of our uh, project Windcore with you. I will start the presentation and share the screen with you. And see. Okay. So, yeah, can you now we can see, now we can see yes. the, the presentation. Very good. Uh, all yours. Thank you very much. That's uh, the Windcore project. It's uh, a multi client project. We performed it with uh, the industry. The industry uh, industrial partners were Suslon for the, the wind turbine and uh, also the blade manufacturing. Uh, operators Shell and RWE. And we had a cooperation in the research with the, the University of Delft. Um, now, this is a picture of quite familiar for you all, I think, but for this uh, project, uh, most relevant was, of course, the, the time to incubation. So the first detectable uh, pitting shaped uh, defects and for the O&M cost, because that's also included in the in this project, then it's important what's the, the rate of uh, repairable damage. Now, this is uh, the main goals of the project were that we, uh, yeah, we like to reduce the, the leading edge erosion, of course, with the, using uh, rotor reduction speed, with control strategies, and also we wanted to develop the correlation between environmental and operational conditions and the lifetime of the, the wind turbine blade. And that's of course based on this uh, leading edge erosion. Now it's a uh, leading edge erosion in general, it, it, it's multidisciplinary use like we've seen in the other presentation. So within this project, um, we first wanted to know what uh, the exact type of precipitation we discover and what type of categorization we use. And um, secondly, that was more the work from the TU Delft. We look for the models because there are available models, but there are also models developed by Tino and other parties. And we well validated this with their uh, water yet test, which I'll explain a little bit more later on. The different control strategies are based on this input, but also on the aerodynamical performance uh, with the loss of annual energy production. And all this result is implemented in the levelized cost of energy uh, calculation by the tools from uh, TNO for uh, planning and cost analysis. The first one was already challenging because it was the precipitation characterization and it uh, we thought in the beginning that there were a lot of weather stations also claiming to have uh, precipitation data but it uh, we discovered already in an early stage that this is very limited especially the, the the distribution of water droplets and the water droplet size it was very limited so we used an onshore uh, location from our weather institute KNMI they have a, a quite a long uh, term uh, 
distometer data set and we extrapolated this to offshore locations and we also have a few uh, measurement locations on our test fields in uh, the Netherlands on shore and we've seen that we wanted to implement this in the actual test of course and uh, the test within the we started with a water jet test uh, but it was not that controllable so we uh, TNO of the TU Delft is uh, developed a new test with a rotating disc and that worked quite well we tested different uh, leading edge protection systems within the project we used a tape and a coating for this and we dis discovered that it was quite um, is, is it still visual uh, Let's see. Yeah. Um, okay. We, don't see now. we lost your presentation. I think the presentation uh, was was uh, missing or not? <laughs> Flew away. Oh, sorry. Is it still visual the the, the slide? Yeah, we uh, we see you, but we don't see your presentation. Ah, that something went wrong. Um, let's see. Um, oh, a bit of a So, okay. <laughs> yeah, we are back. The, Thank you. Yeah. The results, they matched quite accurately, quite good, the, the Springer model. So that was uh, the model we started, we used for this uh, research. And the first step we made to, uh, to link it to the results is that we looked for the area of uh, in the Netherlands, onshore in the Netherlands and near shore to see what's the, uh, the pre prediction of incubation time and we've seen that near the coast it is uh, we've seen that within one year almost nine months you expect the first damage for the larger turbines with the 90 meters a second tip speed if you have the smaller turbines then we've seen with the, that it's even on the coast it has a range from uh, only a few years that it starts already with the first indications and that was interesting because the next step was to look from now. Of course, we have a range of uh, speeds from the maximum tip speed to the root, almost zero. So we can learn a lot from one blade even. So we don't need so many blades. So it's for this uh, research topic, we you looked for the, the, the length of the leading edge protection. And we've seen that, uh, especially on the, the larger turbines, it's it's good to invest in a little bit more length of the on the the the, the offshore uh, situations. I can't present all the details because there are also some uh, some confidential data in it. But this is really a nice topic, I think, for a future project also, because the the operators are interested in how to invest in the leading edge protection. The third work package um, was about the, the, the aerodynamics. And for this, uh, we used an open source uh, model, this R4L platform. And yeah, the reason for it, we don't wanted to use the very complex CFD program. So we used the sort of 2D uh, model based on roughness. So not on the on major macroscopic damage. We didn't change the, the airfoil itself. We used the roughness factor. And yeah, we see a quite good shift from the, the transition point towards the leading edge. But still, if it's talk about roughness, in this case, it's an early stage, it was not that much loss of, uh, of, uh, of production. And yeah, with the assessment of the control strategy, we have to include all these these data, and it was quite complex because we know the rain and wind conditions, we know the, uh, the blade lifetime prediction with uh, with the Springer model, and also the operation and maintenance cost. And that's if my next slide. But it's important to know what type of uh, repair we need to do. And what is the loss of AEP? Now we put this in an, uh, in a model. We tested different uh, control strategies, 
And one, we compared it to the baseline with no control strategy. So we kept on uh, the turbine operational. And we looked for different control strategies in different categorizations of uh, precipitation, especially the, the very intense uh, rain that was only uh, about uh, 0 0.15, 0 0.05 of the, of the time that were respons responsible to quite a lot of impact from the, the, the leading edge erosion. So the, the most extreme uh, rain control strategy we selected in this case is was the only to reduce the tip speed uh, with 10% uh, with the rain intensity of 7.5 or 15 millimeters an hour. And for the really extreme, it's in combination with wind, of course, reduce the top tip speed even with 40%. So not completely shut down of the turbine, but just. And then we've seen that there's already, uh, yeah, the, 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 the difference in, uh, in uh, production is 0.16%. Uh, um, for So we made a, a, quite a profit, not much, because of you always you also lose some uh, some uh, some production, and yeah, we have to include of course the, the wind turbine blade control uh, strategy, also the O and M strategy, and we used for this uh, a case uh, from the Borsele wind farm which, uh, for the Dutch coast, and also we included a lot of experience with the other. Uh, wind farms, which suffered a lot with uh, leading edge erosion. And for this specific case, we see from now, it's representative because we have to use a uh, surface operation vessel, the SUV, for, uh, as a sort of hub. Uh, and rope access for minor repairs. And we also look for uh, cases with major repair. And then we need also a jack-up vessel for a blade swap even. And uh, there's a nice picture from uh, the Van Noort vessel on the bottom. If you see the, the Aerolus, the, the, one of the wind farms, I think the Amalia wind farm, where the, the blades were removed, refurbished, repaired uh, on the deck in a closed environment. And, uh, place back on the wind turbine. Now that's quite expensive. So for this, we have already nine tons euro per wind turbine for this repair. Now we've put it in the, with the different, with the control strategy implementation in the, in, in the model compared to the baseline. And the baseline is only uh, uh, the, the two year mi minor repair of a repair and uh, inspections um, with the control strategy. And we've seen that in a few cases, we also look for some really extreme cases that we see now that we have 154 turbines, major uh, repair blades. Then we see that we have quite a lot of uh, levelized cost of energy reduction. Um, Sorry, it's uh, AEP is uh, of course the downtime and uh, the impact on the levelized cost of energy is 6.5% uh, uh, if we use the control strategy for an, to prevent to an extreme case. Now this was quite extreme. It happened with a wind farm, but in this case we looked for a, for a part of the, the wind farm it needs uh, repairs. And then we see that uh, it was 1.4% of profit we can make with the, the control strategy. And there was also a question about drone inspection, if we can use drone inspection to reduce this cost. Um, this is uh, more and more done at the moment, but for the, for the cost, it's quite a, a very small reduction uh, because the, yeah, the main expenses are in, uh, in repairs, of course. In repairs, you still have to do it with, uh, with rope access or uh, or other methods. Now, the, the main conclusions is, oh, sorry, a bit too fast. Um, that if we use this control strategy for mitigating uh, leading edge erosion by using the high uh, rain intensity classes for 
tip reduction, then it can result in a 1.4% maintenance cost reduction and a 0.16 AEP increase. And that means that we have, uh, if we look for this four yearly minor repair instead of annual repair, then we have 0.6% levelized cost of energy improvement. That this is this is an indication because we made a lot of assumptions and compared it to uh, to uh, actual cases. And also for this framework, yeah, the Springer models uh, was quite matched quite it, uh, but. We have to invest this, of course, for other leading edge protection systems, like the soft shells, for instance. And also, uh, it's important that that uh, yeah, it was mentioned before also with Jacob that for the, the testing methods, it's not fully representative for uh, for the actual situation in the field. Now, for the long term erosion framework, it's uh, we've seen that uh, the LEP code is under investigation that uh, captures a lot of effects on uh, the spatial and orographic features. So it's important to, uh, to further develop this and uh, to give us advice for an operator or a developer to see how to invest in what type of uh, LEPs. And uh, yeah, especially it's a bit an open door, Dutch uh, organization that is the highest for uh, turbines installed at coastal sites. Yeah. And, Last but not least, the limited uh, information about uh, uh, precipitation, and that's why we are now a project progress. It's in, uh, it started, and right at this moment, we started to, uh, to install uh, distometer sensors on uh, strategic locations in the uh, in the North Sea. We already have large data sets on the, uh, the on two test sites. And hopefully next uh, workshop we can present uh, the results already of this uh, work. This will be related directly to the impact on the leading edge uh, erosion risk. That was my uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we have a few questions. I think it was very interesting. Uh, I don't know if I will have time also because I have uh, my own questions too. But uh, let's start by the by the chat that we have uh, right here. And uh, hold on, because I think the first question there's many popping up. But the first one, question was from uh, Ruben Gutierrez, and he's saying, "Nice presentation. I have a question: Is the rough extension around the airfoil leading edge based on field observations? I mean, the extension from two percent on suction side." To 13% on pressure side. Is 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 there the question was the leading edge based on field observations? Is is how is related? Ah, you mean the field observation? Yeah, now that that was is a good question because for the field observations we didn't have so much uh, input because it's it's quite. Uh, operators are quite close to uh, to uh, to see this, but we, uh, we in, for a further project we learned a lot now for a project we're running now we learn more about this. So I can give you more more information maybe later on about the operator. But for this project for wind core we didn't. Uh, okay, basically. that's good. Uh, Ruben knows that you are in that study, so if uh, you want to get in contact and uh, extend this. Uh, this topic is, is very good. This is the workshop uh, function of, and objectives to know all this, what is going on. So very good. Yeah. Uh, we have also another question in the chat uh, from Jacob and it says, Harold, as I understand, uh, you use unrelated probability density functions of wind and precipitation to calculate damage. How will it affect the results if you couple actual rain and wind as we do with the time series? Um, let's see. Uh, Arald, yeah. Arald, this is Marco. Um, I um, yeah, I think they were uh, they were uh, related. So the, uh, the 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 rain and the and the wind speeds uh, were measured at the same time, but in onshore locations. So we had to extrapolate to offshore conditions as well. Okay. Thanks, Marco, my colleague. Hey, hey. wild card, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Thanks>. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, one more here in the chat from uh, Irene Guino, as a colleague from Fenet. It says, uh, Harold, many thanks. Uh, probably I missed it, but uh, which type of sensing system 
you have used to dimension the capex modification in the level I cost of energy. It's a tricky one. I'm going to repeat it yeah, because this seems it's like a context. Well, if, I, if I understand well, that yeah. the sensing system is 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 it's uh, yeah the, the like the, the precipitation sensor system. But the, the do you mean more the the type of model we used for the for the LCOE? I guess, but I don't know if uh, Irene can. Uh, are you yeah. in the yeah. Hi, hi, Harold. Uh, um, I was just wondering if you have considered, as uh, Char Charlotte was also mentioned before, uh, any type of uh, additional sensing uh, sensors uh, to activate the control. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a good question because the, the in this project we didn't look for acti active uh, anticipation on uh, real time measurements. But for the for the Probus uh, project we're running now, we also have a weather radar included, which can help to uh, to have a very accurate uh, control uh, strategy. But uh, in in the Windcore project, we look more for uh, for uh, data from yeah the past prediction. But the next step, of course, is using sensors like, for instance, uh, a, a lighter on the nacelle and uh, a good prediction model. But uh, next time I can tell you also a little <laughs> bit more hopefully about this because it's in progress. Yeah. Good. Let me go uh, for one uh, technical curiosity that I have. Um, which type of roughness model uh, have you used for the airfoil? Then I pass also the question to Marco. He's the, he's the aerodynamic guy. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a semi-empirical model uh, that was uh, uh, initially published by uh, Sandia, and it's uh, based on uh, pan uh, panel methods. Uh, we use Rfoil to to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, I see that uh, there's uh, many interesting uh, what you have uh, presented and. Uh, since we have uh, the presentation recorded, then we will uh, also um, put accessible all the presentations to uh, through the web. So um, I'm very, very happy to have all this uh, interest in the, into this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to go uh, for the break. Uh, let's take a five minutes break. Um, no, a little bit more, 10 minutes break. So I will try to start uh, the next uh, technical session that will be aerodynamics around 11.05. So I will see you then. Thank you very much. And in uh, 10 minutes, uh, we are back here. Thank you.
Hello. Hola, Rubén. Are you with us? Hello. Hi, everybody. Good. Um, just going to wait one more minute, as I say, 11.05. So let's be sharp on time. Will I share my screen in the meantime? OK, good. We can see it. Yeah, I see that um, most of the people are coming back by the number of presenters. 11.05, we are back in business. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Well, now we go uh, we go ahead with the third session, with third technical session uh, on aerodynamics. This is the longest session. We have five presentations, so uh, hold tight because I think we have a uh, very interesting presentations. We're gonna start with uh, Ruben Gutierrez Amo. Uh, in, Ruben is aerodynamic bay design engineer at Nordex, and um, he, you are also doing your your PhD on uh, airfoil aerodynamic and modeling of roughness is that yeah. right and uh, well today uh, we can see that you have already uh, your presentation here uh, if you want to say something else to introduce you or your presentation but the floor is yours so go ahead okay thank you antonio uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for taking into account uh, our study for this interesting workshop my name is ruben gutierrez and uh, i am doing the PhD with the Public University of Navarre in collaboration with TU Delft, and I will present to you the study that I have carried out along with my colleagues Elena Llorente and Daniel Ragni. We have analyzed the current K omega SST corrections to model the effect of roughness on airflow leading edges and the RANS approach. So The content of the presentation, uh, I will give you a brief introduction to understand the study, the roughness corrections we have analyzed, the cases of this study, the CFD setup, results and conclusions. So as a general overview uh, in the framework of modeling uh, the roughness effect on aerodynamics, we have three branches that should be joined. First of all, we have the wind turbine and in which we should characterize properly the roughness and it is really challenging because we are talking about the order of microns of roughness height or erosion height or depth. And we also need to know the core-wise uh, extension. That's why I asked uh, Harald about how they have obtained that core-wise because it is not clear also the radial uh, extension in the blade from the blade tip to the uh, blade root and nowadays it is not clear which kind of uh, characterization is the most representative one and also that will influence the kind of analysis or assessment that is uh, suitable for, for this also if we take a look at the wind tunnel techniques we could find in the literature a huge variety of them here we only have two uh, examples, maybe the most uh, typical ones, the zigzag tape um, and the sandpaper roughness. But depending on the method you use, you could find a huge variety in the result. And that influences a lot in the next step, that is the CFD methods. These methods are really interesting, as you may know, to um, reach conditions that were not possible during the testing or having more flexibility in time and uh, in the design phase of the wind turbine blade but they are really dependent on the empirical conclusions so we should close this cycle uh, all together and and find a, a proper method to to be coherent in all these stages why do we have selected the k omega st as a turbulence model well this turbulence model is the most used in airfoil applications because it is really accurate to integrate the boundary layer near the airfoil surface. 
we also have that this air, this turbulence model is not dependent on three string conditions that is, that means that if we change in the uh, contour of our domain the k or omega values we, we will not have large changes of the eddy viscosity near the wall and this model improves the prediction of the wall shear stress and their adverse pressure gradients and those pressure gradients are really presented by airfoil applications that may, that's maybe the, the key point for the selection of this model but we should not forget that this is a fully turbulent model so we are not taking into account the effect on transition and we are assuming that the roughness state is enough to trip the boundary layer from the airfoil leading edge to the airfoil trailing edge so for this study um, we have used the equivalent sangrain approach and this approach inherits its name from the experiments of Nikurats and also the uh, later defined concept of slicting. Nikurats was the first one in quantifying the effect of roughness on the boundary layer. He placed sand grains on the wall of a pipe and he could measure the displacement on the boundary layer, but it is better if we take a look at the profile in another way. If we use the frictional velocity as it is defined with this formula, then we can uh, make the tangential velocity to the wall non-dimensional with the U plus and the normal distance to the wall also non-dimensional with Y plus. So at the end we will we will have the so known universal profile of the boundary layer. So Nikurats realized that if you place sand grains, the, this boundary profile is displaced and the log layer is conserved. So at the end you have a displacement in U plus. He related this displacement with the KS plus that is the same of the non-dimensionality of the Y plus, but in, at this time we are not making non-dimensional the sand grain height. And he state a law that is a function, but you could also have in the literature other laws, for instance, the Collybrook one. Later, Slicktin tried to make this law universal because this is really uh, specific for sand grains on uh, the flow of a pipe. So um, he, he state and defined the equivalent sand grain height that is the, the height that for a certain technical roughness, uh, like the one from erosion, which will be the, the value uh, for that technical roughness in case we use it in the experiments of Nikurat. So at the end, we could use the Nikurat's law for any kind of roughness. But the, that's, this, that's another thing because uh, you could find in the literature plenty of relationships to, to relate the technical height with the equivalent sand grain. After having that relation and knowing which is the equivalence, how do we use that uh, in CFD? It is important to, to remember that we don't represent geometrically the roughness in this kind of approaches. We are um, modeling the effect of roughness instead. So we are using boundary conditions to create a displacement in the velocity profile and enhance friction in the rough part. So for a smooth surface, K should be zero and omega should be should tend to infinity because we expect really a small eddies in that um, region and dissipating a lot of energy. But in the rough leading edge, we are establishing a finite value of omega because uh, at the end we are increasing the size of the eddies and making more turbulent mixing in, in another way. So for this study, uh, it is coherent to, to assume a sandpaper-like roughness as the one you could find uh, from insect debris or even from uh, the first stages of erosion. And as I have said, uh, this is a fully turbulent model, so we are assuming that the height of the roughness is enough to trip the boundary layer. And uh, we are using a fully rough regime with KS plus values greater than 70. So in the image below, uh, we, we can see that the sandpaper is a bit similar to the sand grains that Nikur has used in his experiments. And that's why sandpaper uh, seems to be a promising candidate to close the cycle I commented to you before. 
because we, in this sense we are using an empirical law that was obtained with a roughness similar to the one that we are using in the wind tunnel and also modeling later. So which are the roughness corrections we have studied? If you take a quick look at the literature, you will find that Wilcox boundary condition plus Helston correction maybe is the most used uh, option. And it is a simple one. Uh, imagine a flat plate. And as I've said, near the wall, we expect to have really a small eddies with that velocity profile. And Wilcox realized that if you establish arbitrary values of omega uh, near the wall, you obtain a displacement of that velocity profile. So that displacement could be calibrated with the following expression and with the SR factor. So this SR factor at the end is linked to the Nikurat's law. However, this was uh, stated for the K standard K omega turbulence model. And once you use this with the K omega SST, you find problems because the SST limiter is enabled in regions in, in which it is not supposed to be enabled. So Hells then developed another correction, the F3 function, and that's why we have Wilcox plus Hells then. The, the, other, the other corrections are the Uapua uh, boundary conditions. Uh, these conditions are based in another philosophy. They, they act directly to the velocity profile. So the uh, solution in, a, in, in the smooth conditions is established in the rough ones with a velocity uh, with a shift in the wall, as I am showing you. And if you integrate this um, equation, you obtain a, that the displacement of the U plus is equal to the solution in the uh, smooth profile at that velocity shift. So at the end, you could relate also again that displacement in, in U plus with the Nikura's law or the Colibrooks one. And you will have other expressions for K and omega to establish at the leading edge. But I will, what I w wanted to highlight is that we have the same result, but with different philosophies. So the case is. Uh, we we have found that the Fener, uh, the, the work of Beatriz was really interested and she validated the um, Wilcox boundary condition plus Helston correction for some cases from the literature. So we found also interesting to, to include them. That's why we have the SERI airfoil uh, with experiments with a Reynolds number based on core length of 1 million. And also we have the symmetrical NACA with a uh, Reynolds number of 6 million. We have included a 30% thick airfoil in this study, and I will let you know later the reasons for this. For all the cases, we have assumed that the technical roughness used in the wind channel is the same as the sand grain of the Nikurat's law because of the similarity between the carborundum grains or sandpaper used in the tunnel with the sand grains of Nikurat's. This is the CFD setup we have used. This uh, structure mesh with O grid, 40 times the core length in radius. We have demonstrated its convergence with the grid convergence method. And we have used open phone to solve a steady uh, equations uh, of number stokes. So if we take a look at the results, uh, first of all, we have the serial airfoil. And for this airfoil, we see that uh, more or less the three corrections work in the same way. Maybe Upois is a bit approach to better approach to the experiments. But if we take a look at NECA, we can find some difference. There are no difference uh, at low angles of attack. That is the same of saying low CL values. But for large values, we we see that Upua boundary conditions is giving us a uh, anticipation of the positive stall compared to Wilcox. For the thicker foil case, why do we have introduced this case? Um, apart from having a loss of lift and an increasing drag in thicker foils, we could also have flow separation at the airfoil pressure side at low angles of attack if the uh, state of the leading edge is rough. So uh, apart from uh, validating the corrections in airfoils, we are validating them 
for large adverse pressure gradients. And I recommend you to take a look to our recent study we published in uh, Wind Europe Electric City, in which we have analyzed the consequences of this kind of flow separation and why it is important to model it and improve the corrections in that way. If we take a look at the performance of this airfoil for an angle of attack of eight degrees, we see that the Opua boundary conditions are the most approached one to the experiments. Wilcox uh, is underestimating the effect of roughness in solid line. But if we take a look now at a lower angle of attack, Wilcox is a bit uh, improved. But for all the corrections, we have a gray region that is not much. That region is because the flow is separating there, even though we have selected by intention cases with mill separation. But why is Wilco's boundary condition plus the Helston correction failing so much? Uh, to, to answer that question, we have varied the Reynolds number based on the core length. And to know how the adverse pressure gradient also varies, and we have seen that if you increase the Reynolds, the absolute value of this uh, adverse pressure gradient also is increased. And additionally, we have a uh, look for the maximum value of KS plus at the airfoil leading edge and how it varies with the Reynolds number. And as we can see for a couple, couple of minutes. OK, so as we can see uh, for low Reynolds, the differences are really small. But for high Reynolds, the differences are uh, more large. The reason is that the formulation of this boundary condition does not take into account the pressure gradient, and the Wilcox approach seems to be less flexible than the effect of Opua boundary conditions in the velocity profile itself. If we take a look at uh, the overall performance of the airfoil or the polar curves, we see that Opua boundary conditions are the most switchable ones, even though there is a, still a gap of improvement and Wilcox is giving an underestimated value. So some conclusions. Uh, up to date, we didn't show any applications of upward boundary conditions on airfoil cases, and with this study, we are happy with the result that they provide. The pressure gradient simplification is more noticeable uh, in Wilcox boundary condition. It is This correction is more limited to, to improve the modeling uh, for thick airfoils. And we we think that we should improve the modeling in flow separation and adapt the corrections in, in that sense. And I also recommend you to take a look on our recent article we have published in which you could find more details about this. You can have yeah. here some references and that's everything. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks to you, uh, Ruben. It, it, uh... It surely is a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, the topic. Um, in questions, uh, your former colleague Beatriz Mendez has uh, posted one in the in the chat and says, uh, "Thanks, Ruben, for the presentation. Really interesting. Up and this is the question: Up to which roughness sizes did you test the new correlation?" Well, that's a good question. Um, we've done it only for the roughness we use in the experiments. So it was like 1.1 uh, um, millimeter uh, divided by the core. Uh, so you have to multiply that by yeah. 0 0.6 meter. But we didn't, yeah. we didn't vary the, the roughness height. Uh, well, are you planning, for example, to have different sizes to see the sensibility of the studies? Uh, not at all. I I, I am uh, planning more to to know the correlation with the the reality. Okay. That's why I was so interested in 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 knowing the answer from Harald about how the extension was correlated and in the same way the the okay. haze. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Alexander Meyer Forstin is also uh, in the chat says uh, thanks, Ruben. Uh, have you looked into the dependence of your Wilcox results and the first cell height? Uh, and then he says, this is a comment. Uh, this model from our experience needs extreme resolution towards the wall. 
convergence mm -hmm. is hard to achieve with this model. I don't know if it's something for you to yes. comment also. I, I agree and I, we felt the, the same challenge. So we, we have ensured that the Y plus value is lower than 0 0.1 for a smooth solutions is lower than one, but for draft, uh, we, we had to, to decrease the, it was not included in the presentation, but if you take a look at the article, you will, you will find uh, the, the first cell height we used above the wall and with that criteria uh, fulfilling Y plus value lower than 0 0.1. Okay. Well, uh, Ruben, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. As I'm saying in all the presentations, uh, uh, the whole workshop is recorded and uh, your presentations, they will be available also on the web. So uh, anyone can access to them and contact you if they want to further investigate or talk with you. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to move on. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are moving on with uh, Alexander Mayer. Uh, that we had the first, the last question. Alexander, I guess you are with us since you are also chatting. Is that right? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Alexander is a researcher at the DTU Wind Energy. And I guess you are going to present uh, about CFD modeling uh, of leading edge erosion. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yes, I am leaving the floor for you because uh, we are seeing already in the screen in presentation mode, right? We can hear you, so go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Just taking time, yeah. So as uh, nicely introduced, I'll be talking about the CFD modeling and actually I will focus a bit more on uh, the workflow actually than maybe some like the results that uh, Ruben showed. Um, so actually, yeah, it was very interesting also to hear um, what, what Ruben had to say about this. So this is work that uh, I did with uh, a lot of other people at DTU. Uh, my co colleagues, uh, Felix Erle, Christian Buck, Anas Olsen, and Mark Gorner, and also Niels Sørensen. So as an overview, I'll be talking a bit about how do we represent erosion. So that, that feeds really nicely into actually the last presentation that we had. Um, then the 2D CFD simulations of eroded surfaces some uh, simulation results and then uh, conclusions. So first, let's start with how do we represent uh, erosion at all, actually? So how do we go from something like this? So this is actually 3D scan of, uh, of a surface um, to something that we can actually use in our simulations. And then, of course, now we already had quite a few discussions about what actually presents realistic erosion. And um, I would say that it's actually quite hard, at least for me now, uh, to really say what it is. So here we have, for example, some uh, results from a rain erosion tests that were categorized in, into different um, kind of severities. So we have light, medium, and heavy. So that's actually what you get for a rain erosion test with a specific droplet size. But as mentioned this morning already with, uh, by Jakob, the can look, so look quite different depending on your um, on the size of the droplet, etc. But Another way maybe also that this can be shown is some work that Airman was doing. So also um, this kind of work that was done by the group at Sandia, where we have this kind of more like chipping patterns. So we, we basically, if you had your original gel code here in red, then over time, you know, actually things are breaking off, et cetera. And then you will have this distinct step, which has a very big impact on your aerodynamic performance as well. So there, there's a clearly also a difference between maybe a, a light eroded surface here where you just have small pitting or something that's actually chipping off. So you have very different aerodynamic performance there as well. The issue right now I would say is actually that we still see is how to go from these images uh, to something that we actually can implement as a, as a surface inside our CFD domain. So realistic eroded surface. And um, we actually got a project, we are going to start a project soon and it's called Learcat, which is trying to do exactly that. So now if we actually go with the, like down the route of taking rain eroded surfaces, the, the way that uh, master student of ours has done it a few years back is actually that he then went into um, basically distributing the faces that he saw of, related to the mass loss. So there's basically this linear mass loss at, at the start 
from rain erosion, and I'm, I'm sure you're all very aware of this. And then you can actually um, distinguish certain patterns. So here is actually the onset. You see like small pitting. And then as we keep increasing it, there's some point where it actually becomes some kind of random ma mass loss. So that's actually when the chipping starts. The idea is now how do we basically represent these kind of surfaces in a stochastic and reproducible manner? So for that, um, we took some, some slices along the, the leading edge, and we are looking basically at the defect depth. So if zero is basically your the undamaged surface, then the minus is basically indicating where we have some loss of material. And this is for the three different specimens that we have. From these, actually, the, the idea by one of our colleagues, Anas Olsen, was to then look into spectra. So let's we could then represent all these fluctuations as basically a superposition of different waves. So if we look at the spectrum of the waves that we basically have on the, the surface, the surface perturbations, these are the, the measured lines and they're far from, from smooth and we are working further on this. But just as the first start, we, we could basically fit some kind of spectrum to this. Actually, in this case, there was a spectrum that comes from ocean modeling, so wave modeling. And the idea was that we have some global parameters that determine the content of low and high frequency content. And then you have some part that is uh, erosion level dependent. So you would basically fit this to different levels of erosion. And like that, you can create surfaces of um, surface patterns that are also reproducible. So you could easily talk about the same thing as well, which is sometimes a problem when we talk about eroded surfaces. How did we then go on and implement this in, in our CFD? We use something that's called a parametric geometry library developed by our colleague Frederick Zähle, where we basically can very easily, it's a Python um, project and it's actually openly available, so you can actually use it yourself, where you then can create all kinds of, of shapes and we use it for very quick mesh generation. So here, for example, we have the, the surface mesh of a full rotor and here's some kind of um, like wing and it's all based on Bezier curves actually so it's a fully smooth grid which is also quite important in this context. The, the, then we have implemented our erosion model as basically a class inside there and you can define it with various different um, parameters so if you do your own fit then you can basically do this yourself as well inside PGL. How does a surface like that actually look like? So if we use certain inputs and we, we now look at some kind of slab that you would then wrap around your leading edge, this is actually what you would get. Um, so the superposition is happening in, in both directions. Uh, you would see some kind of flat areas here. This is basically where we don't have any eroded surface. And then away from it, you have all these little dips, et cetera, to kind of model this rain eroded surface. Now take a slice along here. I mean, there's of course then a dependence when we then go to 2D CFD that we are not putting this, um, we are only modeling one slice at a time. So if we basically now have, have this kind of eroded pattern, this is S, so the, the curve length along the, um, along the blade. So zero is here at the, the front and then you can go to both sides. Then here we are kind of showing the pattern of uh, erosion in a dark blue showing like very deep eroded uh, points. And then if you take different levels and actually also different seats, so this is actually a uh, random number seats because you, you use these random numbers also to introduce some kind of uh, st um, stochastic result in here. Then if we look at different slices, you also have different patterns. And these patterns, we don't know yet for what they actually will do and what will cause the, the most severe aerodynamic loss, basically. So that's also why we then simulated different slices, but then also different random seats, because this will vary the surface. And here, the, what you see for the level four, so our highest kind of erosion level that we tested, um, 
there you actually have the step that I was talking about earlier. So this is the kind of chipping case towards the suction side. Um, yeah, the 2D CFD. So how did we actually do the CFD? Everything was done with an in-house tool called Pi E2D Polar. Pi E2D Polar is based on um, ellipsis 2 d our in-house CFD solver that you can actually use for any for a lot of purposes, also for weight modeling, complex terrain, etc. But here we're actually using it for computing the airfoil performance. And Pi Ellipsis basically gives, uh, gives us the possibility to interact through a Python script with all of this. So inside um, something that we called Pi to Depolar, we can do the pre-processing, grid generation, et cetera. So like that, we can really quickly uh, generate loads of different polars for different um, uh, airfoil surf, um, profiles as well. This is the, how the script then actually looks like, and this will execute your CFD and get also do all the post-processing. The computational grid is uh, very similar to what we've already seen today. So you basically have an O grid. In the center, you have the airfoil, and we are using a structured mesh. The uh, Y plus is 0 0.01 for all our cases. And this is actually how the erosion grid of a level four looks like. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, basically on how to, to grow the mesh away from these little hills and you have all these protrusions. And depending how uh, depending on how big actually some of these little mounts are that you can see, you will also see a change in the aerodynamic performance of the specific slice. So now we, we come to some of the simulation results here. So first, let's look at what happens if we use different slices? So again, this is what I was saying beforehand. We have a 3D surface, of course, but we are only right now taking the approach of modeling 2D. So we are basically making cuts through here. And then we have done a lot of different simulations. Here you can see we did the simulations for the NACA 63418, as we also have some um, measurement data for that. And here I'm just showing, just to, to give you an idea, basically for one seed and five different slices. And we always use the turbine boundary layer for the same reasons as Ruben already mentioned beforehand. So if we now look at the change of lift over drag, drag for compared to level zero, we can see that we have a nice staggering actually in the, in the loss. So this is Reynolds number of 5 million, sorry, and this is one for 15 million. You can, you can see that there's for sure changed the magnitude, but overall actually the shape is very similar. The levels are quite nicely separated from each other. So really showing that our selection of levels is giving also kind of a staggered loss in CL or CD. And um, there's also this kind of variation that you can see depending on what slice you take. And then we, we can now do basically for uh, we did 450 slices and three different seats. If we then plot this basically as PDFs, so for each uh, we have these different levels that I was talking before about. Here on the x-axis you have the loss in performance, and then actually these these lines and dashes etc. They are actually some the statistics, so that's the mean and standard deviation and dashes. We have actually the interquartile range. But that's actually not that important. The idea is that basically with these three different seats, we can, go, can get actually quite a good distribution um, of CL over CD, also showing that the distribution in basically is, is wider. So the, the loss of CL over CD uh, gets wider as we increase the level of erosion. So for level two erosion, actually, it's, it's quite narrow. Um, here, actually, in, in the background, you also have the shape of each different seat that we then combined here. But that is uh, as an idea. And of course, again, the, the mean is uh, nicely staggered, actually, and there's no overlap between the different levels, showing that the selection is actually quite promising as well that we made. This is now for a single angle of attack, of course. It's the same for other angles of attack, but we're focusing on this range because that's the one where you are uh, the the blade is probably performing at so the the optimal angle of attack. The resolved so this was actually what I was talking about was the resolved roughness results. 
but we also did it um, for using a similar model to what Ruben presented beforehand, only that we actually used the Knopf rough, Knopf rough, uh, rough wall model, which is very similar to the uh, Opoir roughness model, actually. And um, I'm not going to go into detail here because it was already very well explained beforehand. But basically, um, the question was, if we are resolving this roughness, then is there still some part that we are not resolving? Should we still be using a roughness model on top of it for the very small scale roughness? And um, we actually decided to use the, the Knopf model, but with a very low, um, basically, roughness height here. Alexander, and, uh, yeah. Of minutes. yeah, thank you very much. And that basically brings me to the results. So um, on the left, we have the results for the thin airfoil. On the right, we have the results for the fake airfoil. Unfortunately, I can't show exactly which airfoils these are. Um, for confidentiality reasons, but overall the, the, the big message here is really, so this is level one, sorry, this is level four erosion at uh, five million, this is the same, but then for the thick. And uh, we, we can again see clear uh, differences in losses, quite severe, actually minus 40 as we go to um, level four, and this the same for the thick airfoils. Um, there are some differences uh, close to store, but in 2D CFD, I wouldn't trust that anyhow. Um, but the interesting part really is that the behavior of the different airfoils, we tested five different thin, thin airfoils, they were around 18 to 20 percent, and uh, four different airfoils at 30 percent. And the, the performance loss is actually very similar between the different types of airfoils, which is quite promising to come to a generalized solution. And here's the, the overview thin versus thick airfoils. So basically, what is the absolute CL over CD um, at, a, at a high erosion? And we can see that depending on how you design your airfoil, there are actually certain types that still outperform the others just because the starting CL over CD was already higher. Conclusions. So we came, we have this uh, layer surface model um, from ocean wave modeling, and we will presented at the next talk. We have developed a fast and robust polar generation mechanism actually that allows us to quickly evaluate uh, these kind of performance curves. And we have similar performance loss for different airfoils. In the future, we, um, we do uh, different airfoil polars actually, so even more airfoil um, surfaces to test. Then the idea is to create some Hawk 2 format and actually put it into uh, Hawk 2, so Air Elastic Solver. And the last big question here is how to incorporate transition in the future. I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to have any questions. There may yeah. be any. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, I think it's a very interesting study in the roughness. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we have some uh, questions. Uh, first, let's go to the chat. And uh, Ruben, he has a question. It's uh, really interesting, Alexander. Do you have in mind the computational time it took it took you to compute the flow over the resolved roughness? Yeah, it wasn't actually much slower than the, the one where we didn't resolve it, actually. It, it converged uh, very fast. So, I mean, relatively speaking, it, it didn't add too much to it. It's more that when we include transition, then things get a bit uh, tougher Slow and take longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of, of from my own curiosity. Um, the airfoil performance has been measured by the CLCD. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then I go to this question because is a uh, do you correlate the loss of uh, the airfoil performance to a loss of the annual energy performance? Yeah, so um, the, the nice uh, thing is that my colleague Christian uh, Back will be presenting next, and he is then using some of the results that we've generated in 2D CFD actually to, to incorporate an AAP loss. Uh, okay. And the part that I didn't show now is that, of course, the CL max loss is actually also quite important. Um, okay. And we also have measured that, of course, and use it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, thank yeah, you. thank you. We're going to move on on the next one. So, uh, next presentation, uh, we have uh, Sergio
Campobasso. Uh, are you with us? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So he's an associate professor and senior lecturer at the Lancaster University in the engineering department. And uh, today uh, you're going to be up, uh, is there already the presentation, uh, machine learning enabled predictor of the wind turbine energy yield losses due to the general blade leading edge erosion. So um, uh, the floor is yours, Sergio, go ahead. Thank you very much. And um, yes, I mean, I, I have been lucky because there have been so many interesting presentations that have been uh, uh, laid the ground for uh, for for the few things uh, I would like uh, to say today. Um, OK, so this is a this is a trivial example, uh, but and this is also being covered particularly by the presentation of uh, Harold and uh, Charlotte before it's about cost. So leading edge erosion uh, is a significant uh, cost and it's going to grow um, and uh, I refer this example refers to uh, to, 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 um, wind, to wind farm size of the um, similar to that that we have in uh, in England in uh, at the on sea uh, wind farm uh, which has a couple of tera of the couple of gigawatt uh, uh, installed uh, um, power capacity so assuming a 0 0.5 percent uh, uh, annual energy production loss also, we are talking about uh, losing 1 million per year and 2% means uh, losing about uh, 4 million uh, pound per year. So these are very simple estimates that go into the very nice cost analysis that uh, my colleagues are developing. So the work that, uh, um, that we are doing uh, uh, aims at uh, reducing the uncertainty in uh, the prediction of the annual energy uh, of the annual energy loss, uh, uh, which is very important for all this cost analysis uh, for um, uh, predictive maintenance uh, for uh, uh, erosion safe mode operation, etc. So the aim is uh, to use uh, simulation and particularly uh, CFD uh, introduce that in uh, the in the industrial practice, uh, but uh, reducing to the minimum the computational burden and to do that we are using uh, uh, machine learning. So this is um, an outline of the, of the things I would like to say. So I'm going to first uh, briefly mention uh, ALPS, which is the energy, annual energy production loss prediction system. Uh, then uh, the, uh, I'm going to talk about the, dam the, da the, the damage parameterizations that we have used uh, in line with uh, similar, I mean, on the, on the wake of what has been described in the previous talk and uh, the databases, validation results, and then a couple of words on ongoing work. So it helps this system basically is about, uh, um, about using engineering codes such as uh, uh, the um, um, fast or bladed or the DTU codes, OK, etc., uh, which are fast, and uh, they are they rely on uh, lift and drag curves, and we need these lift and drag curves for the erosion for the eroded blades for the eroded airfoil. So we use CFD for that. But uh, because uh, we may have a lot of uh, different variety, as Alexander has shown before, of erosion, we are basically trying to uh, generate uh, a very large amount of CFD databases in, in the background and then use machine learning to quickly get uh, the lift and drag data that are needed by these uh, wind turbine codes. And uh, the, way, the way of getting these quick results is to, is to use, in this spe specific case, we are using artificial neural networks. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about this uh, slide, but but uh, as Alexander was also mentioning, uh, one of the key um, points uh, to, uh, to do work on now is basically to uh, extract uh, as reliable as possible the geometry of the field uh, observed uh, geometry. So to have basically digitalized the geometry. Sorry. Yeah, the, a digitalized geometry, and then to to work to to to, to work uh, uh, to work with that. So we also did slices. We in the parameterization we used so far we use two dimensional slices, but also three dimensional slices for the damages which are inherently three dimensional, such as erosion pits and. Uh, uh, gouges. So then we use artificial neural network coupled to fast or the, uh, to fast in this particular case uh, with the turbine model. Then from that we get uh, the power curve of the damaged turbine, and uh, with the site data we get the annual energy production. 
So these are some data on the left. There are the uh, there are the delamination, the delamination damage. So here we we have six uh, reference airfoils, uh, sixteen angle of attack model for each airfoil, and about one thousand uh, about one thousand uh, dam damage airfoils, which means uh, that we needed about uh, one hundred thousand two D CFP simulations, and uh, using similar techniques for automating the process to what Alexander described, we can do that in two weeks uh, using uh, moderate. Uh, supercomputing power. For the three-dimensional case, we considered uh, 1,000 damage airfoils. Uh, and um, again, okay, here each, each of the com computation takes a bit longer. So we use 10 uh, angles of attack for each of these 10,000. And again, it took uh, uh, two weeks to, to calculate 10,000 damage variants. So here is uh, some uh, validation, if one may call it so, of the artificial neural networks prediction and CFD. So here we basically um, invent a damage that is uh, within the boundaries of the database, and we use the database to get it within a few seconds, a couple of seconds, rather than about 63 minutes for each 2D simulation. And this uh, reduces computational costs substantially. We can see here on the bottom. So, um, so for validation, we have be, we have based uh, we have we have be, we have based so we are doing uh, as we go along uh, all the validation that we can. So this is based on uh, on the DTU experiments published uh, in May. Uh, so this is a, a, what we call, what I call the lamination. So uh, part of the trailing edge has come off. There is distributed. There is lower lower level roughness on the uh, part of uh, the leading edge that has been the, that has remain remain naked. So and we include that in the simulation. So as Alexander was mentioned, we uh, use the distributed surface uh, uh, roughness models to, to model the impact uh, of the roughness of the erosion that we do not resolve. So there is this dichotomy between resolving and modeling. And here there is uh, there are, there are, there is the comparison, which in, term, from, in terms of order of magnitude is fine, and we deem sufficient uh, for uh, industrial applications. We have also done some uncertainty analysis from the point of view of the uncertainty in IP that we get with these. We did similar uh, exercise for a three-dimensional case in which we had uh, gouges and pits. So this is an older experiment uh, at Urbana Champaign in the States from Professor Serik. So there are pits and gouges on this. Uh, we reproduce the digital model with uh, the holes and uh, with pits and gouges. And this is a view on the right of the surface mesh. And, um, and and we basically do the, the calculations of this as well. And if, in this case, also, we needed to include some distributed roughness, uh, so to model some roughness uh, in addition to resolving the, the holes, the cavities. And uh, and we get also, in this case, a similar uh, reasonably good accept uh, agreement between uh, measurements and computing. Um, so we also we also did uh, we are also we did them we are we continue to do uh, sensitivity analysis to find details of the of the of the erosion details like uh, cavities so looking at uh, the performance with the semispheric uh, hole or putting a chamfer uh, or a cylindrical hole putting a chamfer varying the depth and here are some sensitivity results uh, so. All of this is available uh, in uh, in reports that we have published, which will be visible on the recording. So I, I prefer to give a complete overview rather than uh, dwelling on a specific detail. So uh, then, to as a demonstration, we considered uh, three levels of increasingly severe damage damages. The first one is the cavity damage, uh, and these are the parameters uh, using the five parameters for the uh, for the cavity parameterization. Then uh, we use, and this is a completely three dimensional uh, uh, damage. And then we use the a mild, uh, a moderate delamination damage, uh, which is uh, on the, on, in the left bottom of the slide, and do, and then and uh, the third damage was basically a more severe um, delamination damage. And we looked at, uh, at, at basically the prediction of the, of the virtual turbine uh, subjected to this type of damages. So this is the annual energy production uh, obtained for the three damages. And there are some sensitivity studies. Uh, so e each of the three bars uh, with the three colors represents a different uh, mean wind speed. And as we see, the damage for a particular, the loss for a particular damage uh, decreases as the mean as the mean width speed increases, and this is because of 
the compensating effect of the pitch control. Uh, and we can also see that for the th for the three groups, uh, the overall uh, IP loss increases uh, as uh, we increase the severity of the damage, as expected. And overall, we get uh, we get a value of the loss uh, which is in the range of uh, two to four percent. Uh, then we did other parametric analysis like this, which is uh, keeping uh, constant uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the distribution of the, of the wind, so the wavebull distribution and of the relay in this case, and uh, the uh, and uh, the uh, velocity and uh, varying the turbulence intensity not much varies and this one instead is changing the distribution which is in, which is important with regard to the site selection an important thing is that uh, these are percentage annual energy losses but of course the absolute values uh, change in some of these cases because uh, the nominal ip of uh, the nominal ip uh, will change with the uh, with the mean wind speed at the site and uh, we reported here the on the bottom the the values of the nominal IPs for all cases, because uh, the, the, the because basically one gets a different picture in terms of absolute loss depending on on what one decides to plot. Uh, okay, so this basically leads to my summary uh, and conclusion. So um, so we we have we are developing and we have partly demonstrated already this use of machine learning to make uh, all of these nice technologies that uh, my previous my previous previous colleagues in their presentations have shown and we are also uh, they've continued to they've continued to develop. Um, so it is important uh, really to and this is well established now to 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 to, to basically differentiate uh, the, the the geometry of the of the erosion damage because uh, it, it needs uh, for more advanced stages really the most precise uh, possible definition of the erosion geometry because even small changes in the geometry may have a significant impact on the annual energy loss. It is definitely uh, important important in our experience uh, to resolve uh, the larger scales, but to um, somehow to include also the effect of the smaller scales by using uh, distributed surface uh, models. And industrial uh, data uh, are definitely uh, gold because they are fundamental to, they are the fuel for all this research and uh, uh, the, the, this is really uh, an excellent uh, resource. So finally, in terms of ongoing research, so so we are also working with uh, with, with the real uh, data. So this is a, this is also a, a, a fraction of a laser scan of an offshore turbine in the in the um, in northern Europe, and uh, we are also doing uh, working on. Uh, uh, on the on analyzing the uh, the impact of different uh, geometry shapes, so these are just two sections of the of the laser scans, uh, and um, I mean some initial results on this will also be presented at uh, Torque. Um, so basically, this uh, concludes my hopefully not too rush presentation, and uh, thank you all for this very nice event, including thanks to the organizers. Well, thanks to you, Sergio. It was uh, very interesting, uh, your presentation. And uh, yes, we do have uh, questions. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Beatriz Mendez, my colleague, uh, she's saying, Hi, Sergio. Thanks for the presentation. Did you make sensitivity analysis to the location of the erosion defects? It's a double question. This is the first one. And then she says, do you have any conclusion about which is the worst location to have erosion? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we did. We did some sensitivity. We did some sensitivity analysis, and uh, and uh, I, I mean, I suspect we didn't uh, write much on this, but uh, just because there was not space. But we did them. So in the case of uh, of the leading edge. Uh, with of the leading edge delamination, uh, so which is a two-dimensional two damage, uh, we we basically found that uh, the, the curvilinear extension has uh, a significant uh, effect after up to a certain point. After a certain point, uh, the value which I don't precise value I don't remember in this moment, but I can dig it out. Something in the order of four five percent increasing beyond that point was not changing the aerodynamic performance uh, uh, very much. Uh, and we also did similar sensitivity analysis for the cavities, but uh, I think it's better that I don't uh, say anything because I don't, I'm not sure of my recollections in this moment. Okay, always uh, staying safe. <laughs> yes. uh, we have more questions uh, here from Jens. He says, uh, thanks for the presentation. Maybe you mentioned it, um, you mentioned it, but did you quanti uh, quantity or quantify the 
AEP error from the, using a surrogate model rather than the C, uh, CDF or CFD? Uh, yes, we did, and uh, it, it, it is negligible. And uh, I, I think we also may, may put a note on this uh, in, uh, in, in, in the energy conversion and management article. And the reason why this is the case is that, uh, at least for these uh, damages that we have considered so far, the agreement, uh, the, 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 the artificial neural networks, the meta models, are very good at predicting uh, the, the CFD uh, results. Okay. And so once that is done, the IP follow the IP uncertainty follows but of okay. course there are other sources of uncertainty yeah yeah and we have uh, one last question uh, from Alexander uh, thank you Sergio regarding your 3d cavity simulations in your opinion how good can runs capture the flow around such a small scale features do we need DNS to study this accurately Hmm. Ah, that's a that, that's 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 a very good question. That's a very good question. I think it depends on the complexity of the cavity that one is looking at. For uh, for smooth uh, for at least geometrically in the resolved uh, representation for geometrically resolved uh, uh, cavities, uh, I think that. Uh, a, a good quality mesh uh, and uh, which is also grid independent uh, may be may, may be acceptable uh, may, may be a reasonable uh, solution but uh, it's an opinion i mean the final answer would come by making uh, by having uh, detailed experimental uh, data available for uh, for single cavities really okay understood well sergio uh, thank you thank you very much very interesting well, we move on. Uh, I know that this noon, very challenging time now for the northern colleagues that uh, usually you have lunch. But since the presentations are very uh, interesting, I guess uh, we're going to stay here tied with the next presenter. That is Christian Back. Uh, Christian, I guess you are with us. Is that right? Yes, I'm here. OK, uh, Christian is professor in DTU for the wind energy department. I believe you also uh, manages the Polacur wind tunnel and yes. uh, you are an uh, airfoil and a rotor design expert. So with this quick uh, presentation, um, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I will share my screen uh, with this. Yeah. Can you see this? Yeah, we can, yes. Great. Uh, and then I'll just... Um, yeah, the presentation mode, but uh, like this, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm I will go uh, and and present. Um, some of you have maybe seen this before at the erosion workshop, but I will uh, present this uh, because this is uh, a very important forum to present this. And this is actually some work uh, I've done with uh, Alexander uh, that presented just before and my, also my colleagues, uh, Anders Olsen and Nils Sørensen. And this was a project uh, that we had together with uh, Wind Power Lab uh, and Rope Robotics uh, until uh, some months ago. <clears throat> um, yeah, and we, this project was called the Lira project. Um, and and this, uh, you can say, modeling and validation of airfoil performance with leading edge roughness was kind of uh, the uh, the core of, of this project. Uh, and what we wanted to do and what we did uh, was to uh, make a computational fluid dynamics uh, on airfoil sections and wind tunnel tests on uh, some selected um, you can say Aronis leading edges uh, of airfoils, and then uh, put these this information into a uh, AP loss calculation, a simplified one. So that is what I want to to present now. Um, and uh, when it comes to the modeling of uh, the airfoils, uh, then we have different kinds of. Uh, Damages uh, on airfoils, we have some symmetric roughness, uh, roughness patches, some symmetric uh, loss and addition of the material. We have some slots, we have backward facing step, forward facing step, start with roughness, store strip, 
Uh, and then we also have some manufacturing uh, and uh, flaws and repairs um, with flat patches, vertical translation of leading edge, uh, upper lower surface overhang, field overhang, wavy leading edge, and so on. And this just illustrates that uh, the, the topic about leading edge roughness, leading edge erosion is very broad when it comes to aerodynamics because it's, it's super hard to describe it very uh, in a very definitive way I just say this is roughness there are super many realizations of this and that's why uh, it requires many different uh, investigations and many a kind of a big database of different types of errors uh, at leading edge uh, but anyway we have to start somewhere and uh, Alexander made a huge study of uh, of this and uh, even though he did that there's much more to do so that's also why uh, Alexander is uh, has uh, continued the work but here is an example of some symmetric roughness uh, where we use a kind of a roughness patch uh, that simulates what you can see at the photo but but then in CFD we have kind of put some surface conditions uh, here and and this is just to, to show uh, how this is modeled um, we then have another type that is either a void into the leading edge or a step up uh, so we call it a positive or negative step uh, where we lose some material or adding some material then we have uh, a slot that is kind of uh, translated from the leading edge uh, we have another type where it is uh, a step down but then it's smoothly going back um, and then we have uh, this also void that is uh, um, there, where the, there is also roughness in the bottom of uh, this void that uh, is definitely making a difference. Um, and then we have the store strip type uh, that is a very easy way to model this in the wind tunnel. And that's one of the things that we did in the wind tunnel because that is easy to do. Uh, so the store strip is actually this uh, black uh, triangle uh, which uh, and then the green one, the green tape uh, above is simply just to, to stick this door strip to the, to the uh, surface. So, so the, the, there are many different, uh, you can say, damages to the uh, surface where we want the surface to be very, very smooth and clean. And, and Alexander made uh, a lot of different computations uh, using uh, a grid like this an OMESH, and then if we zoom into the airfoil here, then we can see it uh, with uh, super results uh, cells into the surface. Um, and then uh, with the actual airfoil geometry described uh, up here. And this is a NACA 63418 airfoil. Um, <clears throat> and here uh, we can see uh, some results where we have the clean uh, airfoil uh, performance and then with a stall strip uh, where we can see how maximum lift decreases from 1.6 ish down to uh, 1.34 uh, and the drag is increasing when we uh, then use this stall strip and this stall strip then is then positioned at the very leading edge with a height of one millimeter on a one meter cord and you can see this is uh, then the difference between uh, the stall strip and the clean surface and we also made wind tunnel test uh, where we uh, tested in the, um, in the Paul Lacour wind tunnel. Uh, we tested at uh, three, five and seven million. Uh, and then we had uh, the clean airfoil tested. We had some roughness patches, some store strips and also some VGs. Um, and, and then we had to uh, base the lift coefficient uh, on the wall pressure because when we uh, cover the, uh, the pressures or pressure holes at the surface, then we cannot uh, really use the, these taps, pressure taps. So we need to use the uh, pressure um, uh, measured at the walls. And that gives uh, a, a very good uh, performance of, uh, of yeah, performance of the airfoil and this is a way that uh, many wind tunnels uh, measure the, the lift from airfoils. 
Um, we have um, also the wig uh, from the airfoil, and that is uh, how we measure uh, the drag. So, so this is uh, then CD is is then measured based on this wig, uh, the wig measurements, and and we correct all the data for for the tunnel walls. These are some photos from from the configuration. So we have a stall strip here. We have some a fine mesh at the leading edge that kind of remind of an eroded leading edge. Uh, we have a rougher mesh like this. Um, so this is uh, different ways to simulate uh, roughness because it's not really roughness, but we try to simulate it. Uh, the thing is that we should kind of make uh, 100 different airfoils with uh, 100 different realizations of erosion. Uh, so we have to kind of stick stick the erosion patterns to the surface uh, to be able to test many different uh, surface uh, different configurations and and then we have to assume that that it's it is almost the same to to stitch the uh, or, or attach the erosion to the surface instead of kind of making a groove into the surface we have tried this before in another project uh, i had a PhD uh, until uh, two years ago that tried this and that is very uh, challenging to make a, an exchangeable leading edge to an airfoil because there, there are some exchange of pressure from uh, suction to pressure side or, or pressure to suction side. So, so this is uh, very different, uh, difficult. Uh, and here you can see some results from uh, the measurements. So we have uh, the clean is the black one. Uh, so this is lift as a function of, of angle of attack. Uh, and and we have uh, then uh, some a stall strip. Uh, that's the blue one. And then we have a stall strip with uh, VGs. That's the orange one. And then we have simply just clean with VGs. And you can see how the VGs, they can actually do something to the uh, to the performance. Uh, but uh, also the star ships uh, are reducing the uh, the lift maximum lift, uh, but the VTs will get it back again. Uh, but we have to pay with some extra drag. So here you see uh, uh, when you add VTs to uh, an airfoil, then uh, you lose some some performance in the lift over drag, uh, but you win something on the maximum lift. Uh, and you also lose even more when you put on store strips. So, so there's um, uh, very good, uh, you can say, information in these wind tunnel tests. Um, okay, so, but we then compared uh, the uh, lift over drag between uh, CFD and the wind tunnel, and uh, the red one is uh, the wind tunnel, and the blue ones are. Uh, CFD either with uh, free transition or turbulent flow, and you can see that it actually it's uh, CFD and wind tunnel compares fairly well, uh, and you can see how uh, lift or drag drops uh, with in general between uh, twenty percent and and forty maybe up to fifty percent. Um, so this is this overview that we want to to give or, or find. Uh, how much is lift over drag uh, decreasing? Because lift over drag is, together with maximum lift, the two very important uh, parameters that we keep have to keep track on to find out how a rotor will perform uh, if it is eroded. So these uh, data uh, they are important to get in a rather simplified form if we want to make a, a fast categorization and and. Uh, uh, accessing and uh, evaluating the rotor performance if it has been uh, if the rotor has been eroded uh, and that also brings me to a simple AP model uh, where uh, the wind turbine owners in general do not have access to information about the blade uh, geometry or the wind turbine control so they have no polars and they have no plan blade plan form uh, that we need to make uh, blade element momentum calculations. So therefore, it would be very valuable with a simplistic model uh, where we can simply just punch in a few uh, 
uh, values so we can find out what is actually the performance of, of this rotor. Uh, and, and we can then relate the power coefficient uh, with and without viscous losses uh, on the plate uh, element momentum model or theory. And then you can obtain a rather sim simple expression for the power loss. And, and this I will actually uh, present at the, at the talk conference uh, and make a paper on this uh, model. So I won't go much further into this, but it is kind of taking the BIM uh, equations and then strip it for a few uh, uh, parameters. Um, and then by doing some assumptions, then get a, a analytical expression that can, uh, where we assume a few things, and then we can actually uh, find out what is actually the uh, performance uh, of, uh, of a rotor, and especially uh, what is the losses uh, coming when it, it comes to a rotor? Because we should not design a rotor using such a, a simplistic model, but we can get a fairly good idea of what is actually the uh, annual energy production losses from a rotor if we assume a few things. Uh, and here you can see I've, I made a, just to validate this model, I made a very simple uh, blade. So this is uh, assuming that we have uh, one airfoil and one design lift. So we have a core distribution like this and then a twist distribution like this uh, to the right. Um, we are assuming that it is only this NACA 63418 airfoil with a design lift coefficient of 1.13, a TSR design uh, of eight. Um, and then uh, we have uh, a local thrust coefficient like this uh, with this simplistic model. So the red one is the BEM model and the simplistic one is the blue one and it compares fairly well, but that's because only fairly well because I made uh, my own simplistic uh, chip correction model. Uh, and here you can see this is the local power coefficient and here we actually have assumed something about how the power performs on the inner part. So, so we are doing something to the inner part of the rotor, but that's on you see, common rotors, not super important because we are not producing much power anyway on the inner part of a, of a blade. So here we assume something about the uh, tangential induction. Christian, a couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I made this uh, also a further uh, test on the V52 turbine, but that's uh, kind of uh, a simplistic uh that's that's only you can say the specific power where we have uh, used this so i've just punched this in uh the v52 data and then i got this uh we have the simple uh, clean case that's the red solid lines and then we have uh, uh, the the bim uh, computations uh, here in, with the dotted lines so this is when we use a simple model we have the power curve made uh, with this uh, with the dotted line and if you use a simple model it is the solid lines so that's how it compares and here is then the losses uh, the power losses uh, as a function of wind speed and and then the BIM computations are the blue ones and the red one is uh, the simple model so it also compares okay um, and if we then compare uh, the BIM computations to the simple model we have some losses if we assume different uh, wind climates with six, eight, and 10 meters per second. Uh, then yeah, we can take this if 50% uh, uh, loss in lift over drag, we can see that we have 3.6% uh, and 4% with the simple model. Uh, with the BEM model, it is uh, in, in a wind climate of eight meters per second, it is 2.7. Uh, percent, whereas it's 2.9 with the simple model. So there are some, uh, it's it's uh, within a magnitude correct. Um, so uh, as a, to conclude, we need to, uh, uh, the aerodynamic performance with leading edge roughness has been uh, computed uh, for many configurations. And, and we made this uh, simple AP uh, model that is doing the loss prediction within 10%. and as a final thing, I just want to show um, uh, that this model is then put into uh, this simple uh, Excel that where we need to put in uh, rated power, the rotor radius, 
uh, and then uh, the maximum tip speed, and, and that's almost it. Then you need to put in the viable distribution, and then for each blade, you can put in, uh, say, a category C uh, uh, or a category D at the radius of 88% of uh, the blade. Here we have 100% and here we have 88% of this blade. And then you can see this gives a loss of 0.1%. Uh, so this is, you can say, this study is just to try to uh, start a discussion of what is needed to, uh, to for, for a blade uh, or wind turbine owners to find out when to repair. So this is meant as a tool to decide when to repair and then, of course, we need to validate this tool and find out how precise is this. So, uh, but that's that's my presentation. Well, Christian, uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, from my from my opinion and uh, my point of view, I think that uh, um, the orientation that you are giving to your research in trying to obtain a tool for the industry that they can really use it easily uh, for a very effective. Uh, results, which means uh, how much are you losing with the erosion of your blades? I think uh, uh, from my point of view, it's uh, something needed because uh, at the end of the research, we need something for the industry because if not, uh, makes no sense to research for nobody. So from that point of view, I think it's very, very interesting how you are orienting uh, your research. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's another question. Uh, since we are very tight on time, uh, there's a question uh, from Beatriz that you will you can see on the chat and maybe you can answer uh, because it's related to one of the I think graphs or some of the data that you show uh, there is a, a big drop on the CL when, yeah. when having uh, storm trip and VGs. Uh, I just have to access this somehow. Uh, um, where is uh, is it up there? Uh, let's have you have that. Um, okay. So, so so what, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, what what is the explanation of that sudden drop uh, in uh, CL when having stores and VGs? Yeah. Okay. So, when you add VGs uh, to uh, an airfoil, uh, it it increases the lift uh, until you can say the separation point is actually just uh, in front of uh, in front of the VGs, and then it drops off. Uh, because then the separation will happen just in in front of or upstream of the VTs, and then there will be a sudden uh, drop in uh, in lift. So that's uh, you can say the the fast explanation to that. Okay. Now, well, Christian, thank you very much. Very thank interesting. Um, as I said before, uh, the the workshop is uh, recorded, and uh, your presentation will be available on the web. So we're gonna move on. Um, to the next uh, and last uh, presentation with uh, Kishore uh, Vimalakandan uh, from TNO. Uh, Kishore, are you with us? I think so. Yes. Can you okay. see me? Yeah. So I think I say already that you are an aerodynamics researcher in uh, TNO. So um, I'm just uh, giving you the floor so you can go ahead uh, with your presentation because we can hear you and we can see the the screen uh, your presentation so nice. just go ahead thanks antonio um welcome all to this uh, aerodynamic performance prediction of eroded and rough wind turbine blade sections using ran cft i think uh, my previous presenters have already convinced that uh, erosion and predicting erosion is quite a, a actively researched topic uh, currently so i'll uh, I'll skip this slide and then tell you more about what I will be presenting. It's a two part study. The first part I will recap on the presentation I gave in the WESC 2021 conference, where we managed to scan an actual eroded blade and modeled uh, the geometrical contours for its effect on the aerodynamic performance. So it was focused on modeling the actual shape change. Uh, in the order of tens of millimeters. Um, and the second part, I will uh, talk about this development and calibration of a transport equation based transition model uh, CFD study um, that, uh, for rough roughness, uh, particularly the distributive roughnesses. So that will focus on a, another level of complexity. So to say that we can model textural differences or contaminated blades. 
um, uh, on top of the shape change that occurs uh, when you have an eroded blade. So the first part, like I said, we managed to uh, scan a blade uh, thanks to my colleague Harold, who also gave a presentation uh, earlier today. So we he went in the field and measured or scanned an actual eroded blade, and we were able to translate that to a CAD um, geometry. And using that, uh, I have presented here uh, the actual geometry of it. And then on the left hand side, we have the, the corresponding mesh with the Y plus of one uh, for the 3D study. And on top of that, we extracted a, 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 a cross sectional line. Uh, representing the worst case uh, position. And then we've uh, run a 2D sensitivity study, somewhat um, um, extrapolating the damage to a second and a third uh, positions to um, replicate an extreme erosion rate. So in terms of the 2D study, uh, here is the results. So the results represent very similar results to my previous presenter, as you can see. The L over D uh, with angle of attack here on the x-axis, uh, along with the y-axis L over D. When we have a forced transition, uh, when we assume a fully turbulent boundary layer, we see that uh, these eroded uh, patterns doesn't seem to have a lot of impact. So in, in effect, it somewhat desensitizes the geometry for um, impact on L over D. Um, but if we model a transitional flow, then we get this drastic drop in L over D, uh, where we see up to 50% reduction in L over D when the material, material is lost up to 1% of the code at the leading edge. And so that's quite a dramatic change when we assume a free transitioning boundary layer on a, a just simply a, a, a change in shape at the leading edge. So here are the results to say um, we saw the same results with the, the fully resolved uh, 3D simulation. And what the outcome here is that I have a, a table here, two tables um, that shows that if we assume different extent of the NREL 5 megawatt uh, blade, and if we assume a different uh, degree of erosion, we, we can see that uh, the blade can see um, at least AEP loss of at least 0.9%, what we see from the NREL 5 megawatt rotor. And uh, what is more interesting is that if, we, if, the, if the blade somehow triggers uh, transition earlier on to have a fully turbulent boundary layer, then you won't see much of a difference going forward from that point. So in summary, from this study, we saw that under fully turbulent uh, conditions, such as tripping the boundary layer, uh, it really desensitized the eroded leading edge. So the, uh, the, the, the results, the influ influential effect on the aero performance uh, seem to be negligible uh, within 0.1% or something like that. Um, but under transitional flow conditions, just the shape change alone Without considering any roughness, uh, we saw up to reduction of 50% uh, in the aerodynamic efficiency, which is quite consistent with my previous uh, speaker. I thought, uh, well, and uh, but if we assume that uh, a naturally transition boundary layer happens when the blade is clean, and then somewhat the erosion is triggering trans uh, triggering transition and having a fully turbulent boundary layer from where when it touches the blade then we can get up to 1.24% reduction in AEP uh, if we assume 30% um, uh, of the blade from the tip is eroded. So the second part is to basically add to this uh, that because transition modeling is quite important for modeling uh, erosion here. So, um, but with roughness, it's, uh, it's somewhat new for the, the CFD um, uh, tool. So we had to uh, look into how we can incorporate roughness with existing uh, transition model for RANS tools. 
So as you know, the boundary layer transition process is extremely complicated one, and it's been studied for, you know, extensively for almost a century now. And in in the current stage, uh, the Langtrementer's correlation base SST LM, we call it, um, has shown quite promising results in terms of predicting transition in the moderate Reynolds numbers. But in 2012, Dazla et al. has uh, proposed this idea of incorporating an additional transport variable to um, model uh, rough surfaces to account for it in a, in a way that we add this additional variable to uh, that can be transported downstream uh, uh, to generate an influence of uh, a prescribed roughness to say at the wall. And then eventually the transition model can take over and then trigger transition and then allow for a turbulent boundary layer to develop further downstream. And later in 2017, uh, Sandia uh, um, at Sandia, Langal et al. has actually implemented this uh, um, propo proposition and shown the performance as uh, on a, another solver overflow to solver. But here uh, we did the similar uh, approach um, in terms to say that the formulation behind it is that we have this read theta variable that we carry forward to um, to trigger transition. On top of that, we have this, uh, we, we add another variable, uh, which we call it the amplification uh, um, variable quantity, and we add that to the pre-existing production term of this read theta term. And by doing that, you constantly um, uh, accumulating this um, amplification uh, quantity, and then eventually you can uh, reduce the local re theta uh, accordingly to trigger transition. Uh, if you want more detail, you can read up on Langa, Letal, and Dazlar for um, in depth uh, numerical things behind it, or you can also always contact me uh, later on. I can uh, brief you on further. So in terms of results, uh, I want to say that we also first look at the numerical convergence with our uh, study or the model itself. Here I show uh, results for three different mesh sizes, particularly modeling transition. It's quite an important one to, to, to make sure that it is we achieve a grid independent solution. And uh, what I want to uh, have your focus on is this plot on the bottom right hand side where I show the angle of attack again transition location. And uh, experimental results are from Sandia. Uh, it shows the red uh, solid curve, while the, uh, the CFD or numerical results are shown in symbols. Uh, what is clear is that the, the medium uh, mesh with 350 points uh, was able to capture uh, a somewhat a grid independent uh, solution that agrees well with the experimental uh, uh, measurements. We also did the same study for uh, to establishing Y plus, and uh, I think uh, this was already iterated previously. Um, what uh, that we found is very similar that you need to have at least a minimum Y plus value of one and lower to be able to predict transition um, in a physical sense. Otherwise, yeah, the comparison was awful and doesn't compare uh, to uh, to what we get in practice. So um, finally, in terms of predicting transition with roughness, um, here I show the results of uh, comparing uh, with Sandia's experiment and incorporating roughness uh, just purely on a boundary layer, uh, boundary condition level. Uh, and then we, we see that the, the results compare well in terms of the transition location, but unfortunately at this uh, transition, uh, at this roughness height, we have very limited uh, results, but if, uh, even though we do seems to be able to capture this transition location, as well as uh, capturing the drag uh, differences when we have this roughness at the leading edge. And if we look at another results, um, just a slightly lower roughness height, 140 microns, we saw the same results where the, the, the drag prediction was quite spot on with an experiment. And sadly, when we go lower uh, in terms of the leading edge roughness height of 100 micron, 
even though the the transition locations were quite well matched, but the the in terms of the effect on the drag was not fully captured. So it needs some further work to understand why this is happening at the lower um, roughness heights to incorporate it uh, for applications at this time. So to conclude, I'm not sure if I went too fast, but uh, to in, in terms of the conclusion, in this uh, two part study, um, we saw that when we have a material loss up to 1% of the cord, you can get AEP loss around 1.86 1. to 1.24%. And that's purely uh, by assuming shape change, not having any um, information about roughness. But uh, later on, in terms of the part two of the study, we realized that we can include the effect of roughness to model transition, and that we saw that this model uh, was able to um, agree well with the measurements for the roughness heights in the order of 140 to 200 microns. When we go smaller, we have a problem that it fails to predict the drag forces accurately. In terms of further work, um, we would like to incorporate both parts of the study to investigate shape change as well as including these, um, these effect of roughnesses uh, for, uh, for in terms of the exposed fibers or contaminations, uh, etc. Also, another uh, very interesting topic is how much this erosion affects uh, uh, hold at high Reynolds numbers in 10 million or what, you know. So that is uh, somewhat of an active topic for further research. And then lastly, but uh, uh, last but not least, the, 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 the model has to be further validated um, for thicker profiles, as previously mentioned, um, with other speakers. Uh, that's it for me. Um, thank you for your time. Well, um, sure. Thank you very much. Um, yes, a very interesting presentation. Um, we have questions. Uh, yeah. Let's go first uh, for the one that we have on the chat. Is uh, from uh, Francesco Grasso. It says uh, thanks for the presentation. What does it mean eroded more than zero point eight percent of the core? It means that 0.8% uh, of the material, 0.8% uh, of the cord uh, of the material is being lost at the leading edge. So uh, it, it's tens of millimeters of material loss from the leading edge. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, there's another question here. Following a previous question, it says uh, the effect of the first cell size over Converge is important when modeling roughness and transition. Yeah. Is it something critical that you consider? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Okay. Because uh, as, I, as I showed you, that if you don't have a minimum cell height uh, to correspond with Y plus a one, the transition locations are way off. They're triggering at the leading edge uh, when it should be 20% downstream or something like that okay. of the yeah. code. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, well, and uh, in general, is a general comment uh, for you and uh, for most of the presentations that I saw um, uh, today. It seems that uh, we need to go one step for the invalidation. Uh, probably going uh, to the wind farms, try to get those blades uh, well characterized, uh, see how is the erosion, and then see how they perform. Uh, it seems like a bigger step. I don't know what you think about that. Absolutely, because I think there is serious lack of uh, experimental data for validation at the moment. And, you know, even with roughness, uh, we were finding only one or two data sets.